So what we're going to do is we're going to finish the last three departments that Jack is going to give us overviews on. And then we're going to bring Logan up. So we'll skip to slide. Well, I don't know what slide. I'll figure that out in a minute. And then after that, we'll bring Bob and, and Joe back for regulatory affairs and regional utility services. So with that, I will to you all. Nine percent, or roughly 400k. Most of that increase is due to the four-year reflection of the pay structure changes, um, similar to other programs, as well as um, two mid-year ads um, that was added in the mid-year of uh, 2023. And one of which is a senior HR analyst for leave administration. Another is a senior HR analyst to enhance the capacity and the throughput of HR's work in recruitment and employee relations kind of work. In addition, you might notice that uh, there's a significant increase in material services this year, and that is 194%, a very huge percentage. Um, and in real dollars, that's about 550,000. So this increase was also to enhance additional capacities, throughput, and expertise. As you have heard that we are dealing with a vacancy issue, we're seeing more and more employee relations uh, type of work, organizational development, and we're actually increasing our capacity both inside of the organization as well as contracting with resources, which um, ends up in material services to really get through this uh, throughput issue that we have in HR. So, mm -hmm. question. Go ahead. The, you said that the total department increase was 56%? Correct. And it's made made up mostly of the two new positions, is that correct? Two new positions. And the, and the materials and services. Correct. Piece combined. Correct. Yep. And was some of that software, or was it? Um, no, software is uh, centralized in digital solutions, okay. which we'll touch later. Yep. Okay. This is a, in HR, the material and services is primarily professional services from uh, professional human resources firms or recruiting uh, help. Um, and so it's basically capacity enhancement for recruitment and employee relations. And, and what was the last one? Uh, employee relations. Okay. Yeah. And is there, is an organizational development is a part of that as well? I assume like your team building and the, your, n not, not Myers-Briggs, but the, I can't think of the name. Yeah. The CBI? Yeah, yeah that type yeah. of thing as well, right? So CVI specifically is about it in uh, culture, equity, and learning. Oh. Um, HR is a supporting unit for that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Yeah. Um, for the Washington County Agency, the implementation of the state required uh, paid family leave is uh, budget-wise um, a minimum of 400K, if I remember it right. And probably, I think uh, that's because of a couple of FTE to manage and implement the program. Mm -hmm. Is that housed in the HR department here? It's housed in Quick. Oh, it's housed in Quick. Okay, thank you. In our so, so I will add the, the payout and the finances are housed in Quick. There is a one um, leave administration mm -hmm. position that is housed in HR who will be interacting with the employees to support the administration of that function. So. It is just cheaper to do it in quick than try to do it as an agency. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yep. Alrighty, next slide. So HR has 10 FTEs in total, and then you see a list of their um, responsibilities, which is a very standard for uh, um, a full-service human resources organization. I want to highlight the supporting functions or partnering functions at the bottom of the list. It's the equity, diversity, and inclusion work alongside of uh, culture, equity, and learning, as well as the employee learning program that uh, we're partnering with the culture, equity, and learning as well. So, uh, next slide. The primary driver, really, as I mentioned, is capacity enhancement. We are seeing a higher than normal vacancy rate, and uh, the throughput um, within human resources, not to the fault of efficiency, but really to the fault of capacity, is um, um, it needs a lot of help. So we are making some significant inc um, investments this year, in both internal to the organization as well as with contracted resources. It's really to increase capacity in talent acquisition in the relation, uh, employee relations 
management and also um, to enhance our outreach to a more diverse talent pool. And there was a question earlier about that. We are connecting with the culture specific uh, organizations to understand how do we tap into those talents. We're trying to go to job fairs. We're trying to advertise not only on NeoGov, but also at uh, very specific um, professional uh, organizations, job sites to really increase our outreach um, on talent acquisition. I just have a, a comment that I'd like to make about, about that, and that is that when, I don't think we always think about the cost of an empty position, because many times what we, what we do in, at, at the county and at other places that I've worked is you hold, you don't fill positions to try to meet your budget, but there's a big price to that. And I think that we're in the same situation here if we can't fill a position. There's a price to that, and uh, so I'm really pleased to see the work that's going in to filling these positions. It's, it, we're not gonna get through our strategies. We're not gonna get to that next level if we don't have the people in place to do the work. So thank you for making a commitment here, and the 56% doesn't bother me, just thank saying. You. Thank you, Director Trees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Chair Sun. Uh, when you are recruiting, say, college graduates, how far do you go on your outreach as far as the career fairs, just within Oregon or within the region? Yeah, for, for yeah, where we send our people to is uh, normally just uh, in um, the colleges just in the region. And uh, we actually currently, when we look at our classifications, we don't have too many entry level positions that are suitable for college graduates. So we have some. And uh, within our organization, we are starting to um, you might have seen some of the new positions that we're adding are part of our apprenticeship program, which are designed for folks with very little experience to join our organization and learn from the ground up if they are passionate about our work and our mission. So that is starting to happen. We're adding more positions in that. But right now, I, I want to say that we actually don't have a huge um, recruit from the colleges directly at the moment. Okay, thank you. They come to us through their um, co-op programs, so the MECOP and CCOP programs. That was my that, next question. Yes, yeah. yes. So we utilize um, the students, and they, they really enjoy working with us. Yeah. COVID kind of made it go down. Yeah. So we're hoping to get that back going again. Yeah, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Sam. And I want to highlight a couple important projects on the next slide. Um, the projects that's going on in HR, it's a class and compensation study that we're going through. The representative group's uh, work is already completed, which is incorporated partially, uh, which is incorporated into the labor agreement. We're currently working on the non-representative groups um, in, that is currently in progress. The labor agreement implementation, so now that we have the labor agreement signed last year, we are supporting the supervisors uh, who manage representing employees on what does the labor agreement mean and how do we actually implement those uh, details. We're working with the Teamster to also implement a refined pay for performance system to um, kind of provide guidance on what that looks like. In addition to that, we're evaluating our med medical benefit um, program within the district. The goal is uh, both to kind of be mindful of our cost and al also making sure that we have the right kind of coverage to really cover our employees that carries the uh, um, district's value and then um, continue to be competitive in that area. And one of the program, we are looking at the state's program as a comparison, so we don't have that work done yet. We will be bringing more information back to the board learning, back to the CWAC, just to share some of those information. So. Uh, next slide. We're just a small employee pool, so yeah. we think there will be benefits to aggregating. Yeah. That concludes uh, the presentation and information on Human Resources Department. Any additional questions for this department? All right. So no more questions. We'll move on to the Research and Innovation Department. And the information for research and innovation is, uh, starts on page 199 in the proposed budget. <clears throat> this department's total budget has an increase of 86% or roughly $1 million um, as a total level. And then uh, the, if you look at the table that's on the slide, you can see that the FTE actually grew from seven to 16. Quite significant, right? And I want to say that it's actually not added FTE. It's also a result of a reorganization. So there used to be only one program under research and innovation, that is uh, the Integrated Water Resource uh, 
uh, water resource technology research. And then um, in this year's budget, we actually reorganize another program, the te technology development and research program into this department. And that program used to be under WRD, uh, which is the water resource recovery department. And that is um, kind of the net increase in this department. There is actually um, no um, actual personnel increase for this department, but there are two temporary, long-term temporary um, positions that was converted to full-time. So, so essentially there were, by budget language, there were two ad FTEs because temporary don't count as FTEs, <coughs> but by headcount, actually, uh, this department is staying pretty, pretty stable. Personal services costs increased 91%, or roughly 800K. This significant increase is due to the combination of the technology development and research uh, program being moved in. Material and services increased by 59%, or 100K, and a big part of that also came from the TDNR um, program moving into this. So it does include additional 30,000 uh, in training budget to rebaseline our, um, our research and innovation staff um, for this year's training. Next, year. uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, there are two programs now in this department, the Integrated Water Resource Technology Research and the Technology Development and Research. The, these two programs work really hand in hand together. The slight difference is that the integrated water research, technology research, uh, tend to focus a little more on the fundamental technology uh, versus the technology and development and the research focus a little more on the treatment, on the applied, on the processes that we do. Uh, there is, I apologize for a slight formatting uh, error I made in the slide. It's the last two bullet under integrated water resource technology research actually applies to both programs. That was supposed to be a two bullets that goes across um, to the two programs where they collaborate and conduct research to support compliance operation and planning, as well as they both uh, collaborate and advance innovative technology across CWS. Next slide. I want to highlight the purpose of the Department of Research and Innovation. The purpose really boils down to four points. It's meeting the need of the river, it's uh, solving the compliance challenges, it's optimizing our operations as well as uh, helping the organization to make data-driven decisions. And it, it's really to focus on both the fundamental and the applied research, where we um, kind of do some research in the labs and then apply them in the uh, facilities and then do proof of concepts and see if they work. And then we launch a research proposal program every year that is across the entire organization. As I mentioned, that research and innovation, they don't work in silos. They actually support all the departments um, in, the, in the district and actually conduct research on behalf of the departments. And, and then developed um, overall research and innovation program roadmap that is a significant achievement for them uh, this year. Next slide, please. So these are some highlights of the research work that is being done in res, um, research and innovation. In the scientific research area, we are looking into the eDNA, we're looking into the microbial source tracking method, and those are all in partnership with um, various departments. And uh, um, specifically, like the microbial source tracking, that is related with our compliance work, which Bob and the uh, regulatory affairs will go into a little more details on our regulatory compliance, um, that is to support part of the DEQ's question about, you know, we are seeing um, bacteria in our stormwater. Where exactly are they coming from? So some of this research help us track the, the source of these uh, bacteria. And then also we leverage the science and modeling to overcome anticipated compliance challenges, developing the, um, the water quality model for phosphorus and TMDL model scenarios, understanding the source um, and fate of PFAS, uh, which is the chemical that is uh, really catching some media attention right now. And then we are doing our research to understand it. How does that um, show up in our uh, water quality and uh, what, what are some of the future plans that we can do? And this is uh, also in partnership with the Regulatory Affairs Department in anticipation of any future compliance challenges uh, that might come our way. So. Can, can I ask a question here? Mm -hmm. and it Maybe something that I just need to hold until after a couple more slides. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the th things that the organization did this year was it started a program for at least elected officials in local government, our local government partners called CWS Essentials, and I think it was open to you as well. And with that, uh, for one of the tours, we went through the lab 
at least one of them. Uh, and it's the amount, and I guess so, I've had the benefit over the last two years of going f through the lab twice. And um, it's very impressive how much equipment is in there and the use of it, like scary impressive. Uh, and so when I think about your research and innovation department, I think about a piece of that machinery, and I assume that machinery carries a humongous price tag. You know, I immediately went to movies and those electron microscopes, and you know, I don't know what it takes to look at the molecular, use molecular tools, or try and identify bacteria, as you talked about. Um, but boy, am I glad it's being done. Uh, how, how does the accounting for all that specialty equipment, whether it's physical or a software package available through licensing, is that part of like a capital program or? The initial investment, if it meets the capitalization threshold, it would be a part of a capital project program. And the ongoing, our heaviest uh, recurring expense is actually on uh, samplings and su supplies um, that, we, that are being used in the lab. Normally, compared to the investment of the equipment, <coughs> those are not too huge. And, and obviously, we are controlling the scale of our researches. Sometimes uh, okay. it's we're not yeah, yeah. whether if we want to do a lot of research or whether we want to do a little um, just to kind of understand it better. Okay. So, so the story is, uh, it depends, and uh, it really depends on which area that we're getting into. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There is a line item for tech and scientific supplies. Is that where? And that's exactly where it is. Yeah. Yep. So a, a great deal of uh, um, TDNR's work where we are connecting with the uh, uh, water, res uh, water resource recovery facilities. And then um, the couple highlights in there is we're evaluating the biogas potential from coal digestions, materials, and suitability. That will actually contribute to the future renewable natural gas project that we are currently working on um, at Rock Creek. And again, that's a partnership with our water resource recovery uh, department. And uh, evaluating water quality in the natural <coughs> treatment system to better understand the nature-based solutions. We're seeing really good result of a phosphorus removal from our Fernhill natural treatment, um, natural, natural treatment system, and we're monitoring to study it, to understand it, to understand if it's a su sustainable or does it have ebb and flows. Um, and then also we're studying temperature profile and developing mitigation strategies to reduce climate impacts on the thermal loads. That is the work that is currently being done in the water uh, resource recovery facilities where we're, we, we know that the thermal load is a huge part of our compliance and we're doing um, testing different kind of scenarios, testing, piloting different kind of technologies to reduce that uh, within the plant. Next slide. So digital twin and uh, data utilization, and uh, I don't know if everyone have heard digital twin as a term, it's relatively new um, in the area of technology. Um, Basically, it's a digital replication of a physical object. That's uh, really what, uh, what it means. And in our line of work, it's really a dynamic, up-to-date digital replica of a built asset or the environment that we're working in. You can think about a water resource recovery facility or a pump station that we're operating or a pipeline that we are maintaining. If we have a digital replication of it and enough sensoring technology that provides us the data um, of the operating conditions of those, we can actually make um, a more timely uh, and more efficient decisions on how to operate and how to um, build these uh, areas. Now, it is a long-term goal. Uh, I'm not saying that we can come up with a one-year plan and all of a sudden we have an entire system of um, a replica, but that is something that we're working toward in different areas within the organization. There are actually some success uh, in some areas. And uh, mm. all of that is to drive our data-based um, decision-making as well as the uh, deployment of our sensor technology. Now, you, this committee asked a lot of great questions about the data that we have in the organization. Many of your uh, questions are ac actually can be answered by data, and we are actually uh, investing in our data management and utilization within the organization to make some decisions. Uh, next slide, please. So that concludes the research and innovation department. Any questions or comments? That last bullet goes to the AI question you're always asking about us. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. 
first of all, I need to apologize. I, I've got to run off here in a minute to take care of some family stuff. But uh, uh, Jack, is the IT operations falling under this area that you're dealing with, or is that Ting? Is she involved in? I, I don't know who's involved in this. And I mean, we, we understand there's an explosion. We understand that we're probably all going to be working for a robot someday, but mm -hmm. it, it's not immediate. Uh, what What's happening in terms of how you're managing that activity in that department? Absolutely. So the IT um, in our organization, we call it Digital Solutions, is the next department that's coming up. Um, from an organization perspective, it's a different department with uh, research and innovation. At the same time, there are two departments that actually partner um, and work together quite a bit. And both departments fall under my portfolio right now. Okay, yep. thanks. So Ting and Rick Shanley are the leaders of this group. Yeah. You're lucky to have both of them. They're very good people. Oh, I am appreciative every day mm -hmm. uh, for that. They're the research and innovation department, you mean? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Ting is doing the water resources side, and Rick Shanley does the TDNR side. Yeah. TDNR. Okay. You Technology development and research. Oh, got it. It's right there in front of me. <laughs> and Scott, Randy? Ting, Lou, and Scott Rick Shanley. Rick oh, Rick Shanley, yeah. He's an engineer they got from HDR. <laughs> yeah. Corolla. I know. Corolla. I just, Corolla. Yeah. 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 Oh, Corolla. That's right. Yeah. Corolla. yeah. <laughs> They've yeah. each presented to us, and, yeah. but still working on the names. Thank you. All right. So the next department I'm presenting is uh, Digital Solutions Department, and uh, in many other organizations, it's, it's referred to as the Information Technology. And the information starts on page 155 um, in the proposed budget. Next slide, please. So this department's total budget has inc an increase of 17%, as you can see on the slide, and uh, roughly $1.1 $1 .1 million uh, in dollar increase. The personnel services cost increase 19%, or roughly 630K. And, uh, and again, the majority of that is due to the four-year cost reflection of our pay structure change. There was one FTE ad within this department. Um, it's a data architect um, position. As we mentioned that we are investing in our data management, data utility utilization, that is one of our um, position at in digital solutions to support that structure. And uh, that position specifically to support the entire organization's data governance, data management, and the utilization of the data. So material services increased 16% or 450,000. And the majority, the entirety of that actually is related with software license cost increases. And there are some new investments within that 450,000 roughly change in new software investments. We're investing in cybersecurity related softwares. We're investing in workflow management type of softwares, like uh, project management, as well as uh, supporting supplier diversity. We, are, um, we have in the budget to incorporate the B2G now, which is um, supplier diversity uh, information tracking software. And uh, a smaller increase in professional services to augment some resources and some expertise that we currently do not have on the team. So that's uh, some small increases. Uh, next slide. So Digital Solutions also has two programs. And on the left-hand side, you see the IT business applications, 9.5 FTEs. Uh, infrastructure and digital security also has 9.5 FTEs. The reason you're seeing half a FTE on each side is that we're splitting the dig director of Digital Solutions uh, position in the middle that supports both programs. You can oversimplify and consider the left-hand side the IT business applications as the software and the data team. Uh, on the right-hand side is the infrastructure, the computers, the phone system, the mm -hmm. network, the internet, as, as well as the cybersecurity team. Uh, next slide. So in the software and infrastructure, the major initiatives that we're taking on is one is to centralize software license management. And the reason uh, for that is uh, in the past, there's a lot of software licenses that are managed 
within the department, they are procured within the department. And over time, sometimes we run, we run into duplications, sometimes we, we run into a, a little antiquated softwares. So um, by centralizing the management of the software license, but still have the utilization and the use case in the departments actually help us to take a strategic step on our current software management as well as the future deployment. And uh, it also helps us reduce long-term cost by developing a strategic approach in rolling out softwares. And uh, in the technology world, it's oftentimes called technical debt. If we do something that's easy and quick today, or um, it's gonna cost us later. So um, that is a, a jargon in the IT world. So, And we also, in addition to the software side, we continue to modernize our digital infrastructures um, by replacing and upgrading a lot of data in an obs obsolete system. So our network devices, our Wi-Fi access points, our phone systems, Many of those are similar aged with uh, the uh, ABC building, the administrative, administrative building complex. Um, Chair Henderson, you had a question about how old the building was, and that there's actually a lot of digital infrastructure within the building is just as old. We're going through them uh, one by one and replacing them and modernizing them. Next slide. And in addition to that, we're enhancing, as mentioned, our ability to utilize data for inform, informed decision making. As research and innovation are looking into the use case of the data, digital solutions actually provides a foundation of the data governance, the databases, the data lake, data quality, as well as the integration. So they actually do a lot of the behind the work things. Um, and then in addition to that, the next bullet is staying current on the latest technology. We are increasing the training and the learning dollars a little bit in digital solutions to support our staff to continue to grow in these areas and stay up to date on um, the latest technologies. And that concludes the uh, information on digital solutions. Any questions or comments? All right, well, if there is no questions or comments, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jack. So, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to jump ahead on the agenda to the utility operations. So, if you if you don't want me to ruin the surprise for what's coming later, you can close your eyes till I get to slide 100 here. <laughs> oh boy! Sorry. I'm several too many. <laughs> Watch it, I'll get started while we're moving to the slides. So, uh, good afternoon. Just, yeah, uh, let me, I've got to kick off this section here. So I just want to tie. So before Logan starts, I want to uh, reference this back to the conversation that we had this morning about uh, the functional areas. So this is the other functional area. Normally we would also, ha we would have had regulatory affairs and regional utility services, which is a business services function go and then uh, Logan, but so this is the uh, this is our utility operations functional area, and so it co it's comprised of 277 FTE, and represents the operating budget of about 65.8 million dollars. So it's larger than the business services piece, and much of our much of the CIP that we deliver is being delivered through these operational units. So with that, we'll <laughs> cut Logan loose. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the committee as well as my colleagues at Clean Water Services making allowances and adjusting the schedule to accommodate this. Uh, again, my name is Logan Olds. I am the uh, Water Recovery Resources and Services Manager for uh, Clean Water Services, and currently I'm acting as the uh, Interim Managing Director for Utility Operations. So there's a lot of words there, but basically uh, I, I facilitate uh, my team's success in everything related to operations uh, for clean water services. It's a bunch of great folks uh, that are there. So the slides that I will be presenting today is the, the direct result of their efforts. And I'm also pleased, as, as others have mentioned, that um, uh, the slides directly tie to the roadmaps uh, for each of those programs. And it's exciting that we've been able to make that step this year and, and start to unify the organization overall behind several functional areas. So with that, uh, we will move forward to the first one. Uh, water resources recovery, uh, this is largely the group that uh, provides the operations and maintenance services for our resource recovery facilities. And uh, we've had some changes, uh, as was just alluded to uh, by Jack. 
Uh, the TDR group uh, exited the water resources recovery specifically within TPS, which we will uh, get to later on. And uh, that caused a reduction in uh, the number of personnel. Uh, we also transferred two maintenance positions to uh, the asset management group in facilities out of, uh, out of our team. And this was largely because they were performing facilities roles uh, within their function in maintenance, and now facilities is part of that. Again, creating these cost center groups is now within one specific focus area. Uh, the changes in materials largely due to, as everyone knows, there's been a lot of inflationary pressures. Uh, there's been a lot of supply chain issues. Uh, there's also been changes to our regulatory environment. And as a result of that, uh, there is a hit to our chemicals. Uh, we are looking at some, uh, doing additional research to identify if there are, are alternatives, as well as actually, uh, once again, taking a look at seeing if there are certain aspects that we may wish to do in-house to provide greater reliability for those supply chain issues, as well as uh, at this point, because of inflation and other issues, it may actually be more cost effective to move those services in-house. So we'll be looking at that over the next year. Uh, next slide. As you can see, uh, here are the resource recovery facilities as well as uh, the pump station crew. Pump station crew manages uh, 44 pump stations throughout our, our service area. Uh, this also includes treatment plant services, which provides engineering, construction management, and you can see it used to include technology development and research, but again, those uh, staff members have been moved to uh, the research and innovation team. Next slide. Uh, future compliance issues, I'm quite certain you'll hear more about this uh, from Bob, and we all love hearing Bob talk, so I'm not going to steal his thunder. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, it's going to be some interesting times in the coming years related to Fern Hill, and uh, we're uh, ensuring that we're spending and allocating the resources that we need to ensure as best we can that we meet the compliance limits, especially during the summer months. Uh, for those of you that recall the heat dome effect of two years ago, uh, in my world with my team, that was absolutely terrifying because it created uh, very unique conditions at our facilities that required some very creative problem solving and uh, continue to impact our thinking to this day. Uh, as you'll notice through the expansion of our reuse program. So the, the five MGD during, in 2025, we've got some great projects coming up this week to uh, provide additional reuse water to recover native lands uh, that we're very excited about moving forward with. So that's pretty neat. As well as uh, recovering heat. So the, when people use water, they tend to increase its temperature. And if any of you have used a, a mini split or a heat pump or any of those technical terms with your own HVACs, uh, we're talking about a similar concept, although on a much, much larger scale to recover heat from the effluent of the Rock Creek uh, Resource Recovery Facility. So uh, that's gonna be super fun. Can I ask for a pause real briefly? Having that heat dome experience, uh, I'm assuming was sort of the, there's a benefit of being able to take that experience and use it as, well, what I got out of it is, oh, new scenario in my thinking about how do I live as a person into the future uh, with climate change challenges. But I'm finding that that feels like a long time ago now. Could you very briefly remind us what was that like for the whole water resource recovery domain? <laughs> you, you mentioned it, but I don't know, what, what did you do? I mean, it was forecast for two, three days. Did you go out and cover these pools with with uh, tarps to provide shade. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm thinking totally out of the stupid box, so uninformed box. Thank you, Chair Harrington. Uh, I could spend about 30 minutes, so I'm trying, my brain is trying to think, how can I say this well, then precisely? Well, let me put it this way. I would invite a, a case study uh, white paper, uh, to remind us all. 
we did produce a, uh, a document through TDR to evaluate what occurred, uh, what alternatives uh, could be evaluated, and were then evaluated to mitigate these impacts. We've settled on what we believe is the best option, and uh, that's currently being evaluated through this summer with the idea that capital planning associated with it would begin in fiscal year 25. So can a lay person like me find that on cleanwaterservices.org and would I understand it? It is very specific. It is a small part of the, uh, the TDR program, so it doesn't, it doesn't create a large cost at this point that's associated with it. We would be more than happy for yourself, members of the committee, uh, the board of directors, to spend time with you and, and discuss that. Um, Clean water, yes. sea whack. That would be a good option as well. The, uh, uh, to put it in perspective, we came within 0 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit of violating our permit at Durham for nothing other than the temperature of our flow through the facility, which we could do very little about. And uh, again, as a result of climate change, we have to be prepared mm -hmm. for these types of incidences to potentially occur again in the future. Mm -hmm. So we need to plan and, and uh, be prepared. Didn't that heat dome make its way across the country? I don't remember. And did anybody blow through their permits? I know we have the only watershed based one, but we're unique because we of the salmon. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob can talk about this one uh, more as well, but uh, at Rock Creek, we've actually implemented the use of uh, liquid ammonium sulfate. And essentially what we're trying to do is uh, reduce or eliminate the production of chlorinated organics, which are uh, disinfection byproducts. These are long carbon-based molecules, um, chlorinated, that uh, have been shown to potentially cause cancer. And uh, the desire is to eliminate uh, their formation. And by adding LAS at our Rock Creek facility, we've been able to show a significant, if not complete, elimination of the production of DVPs. And uh, very pleased by this. The uh, workforce development issue, uh, Jack alluded to this earlier, as well as I believe uh, Mark and Diane may have, is that um, uh, the apprenticeship program, our internship programs have been completed for our maintenance technicians as well as our operations. We are going to be implementing uh, the maintenance internship program. And this is a program that essentially, if you are a high school graduate, 18 years of age, the intention is to be able to take anyone, and I mean anyone, with an interest, expose them to maintenance in our industry and see if they would like to choose it and pursue it as a career. Uh, what we anticipate is uh, we're currently, due to a number of retirements, uh, we're, we're hiring a number of operators. And once that stabilizes in the spring, we intend to uh, open up that program as well to, again, people that are 18 years and older. That's gonna be really neat. Everyone's pretty excited about that. Uh, next slide. Uh, as was Ms. mentioned Kate also. Morgan? Yes. Very quick question. Um, are those paid internships? Yes, they are. Okay. Thanks. Initially for a period of six months, and there's an entire training program, not just um, hands-on training, but exposure to different areas of what we do, as well as a requirement to complete educational criteria each week associated with the program. Yes, pretty robust. Uh, we've talked about uh, issues with air quality regulations, uh, essentially creating a situation at Rock Creek where we were no longer able to run our generators there, and our upcoming project with uh, Northwest Natural to produce renewable natural gas from our biogas for pipeline injection. Uh, moving to the high-strength waste and co-digestion, uh, this is an opportunity for us to essentially monetize our underutilized infrastructure and uh, by taking high strength waste. So as was mentioned, we will take in fats, oils, and grease at Durham. We have the ability to take high strength food waste at Rock Creek, increase the biogas production there, thereby increasing the production of renewable natural gas, which we can monetize. And so we would once again, tipping fees as well as revenue from um, <clears throat> the renewable natural gas. 
And all of this stuff is really neat because uh, it creates a foundation uh, for net zero. And this is part of our climate action plan. So when we think about uh, the precursors, right, carbon emissions, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, these are all uh, actually activities that are relatively established in our industry that we can take advantage of to ensure that we're doing our utmost to offset uh, the emissions caused by people sending us their uh, waste, right? Are there any incentives for those waste, those alternative waste to be brought to us, or is it all tipping fees that they pay for the privilege of bringing them to us? It's a little bit of both, actually. Um, since we're just, we're just creating the program, you have to be a bit creative as you uh, start working with our industrial partners. There's also a unique opportunity here to change uh, an aspect of our business model that traditionally relies on the conveyance of the waste to us in our interceptors, our, our pipelines, and actually uh, take this high strength waste and uh, inject it directly into our anaerobic digesters. It changes the dynamic of the program and creates additional opportunities for industry as well as creating additional opportunities to generate uh, revenue and um, offset greenhouse gas emissions through us. Uh, a, a good quick example is uh, uh, many producers of food for consumption, there is wastage, whether it's expired or it's wasted during uh, manufacturing, and it's simply sent to an open air landfill where it rots and those methane emissions can then escape to the atmosphere. Instead, you can capture that food waste, bring it into our facility and put it straight into the digester, and you're not uh, sending that methane off into the environment. Okay, next slide. Uh, treatment plant services, again, uh, they provide engineering services and do a great job uh, for the resource recovery facilities. We listed a few of their major projects that are upcoming here, uh, the West Basin Master Plan, and uh, we've completed the East Basin Master Plan, so we're now on to the West Basin, and that will be coming before uh, members of, of CWAC as well as the board. Uh, <clears throat> we mentioned previously, uh, the development of integrated teams within clean water services. Another group that we would like to focus on is creating an integrated construction management team that focuses on all of our projects rather than being dedicated to specific areas. Uh, we believe that this will create a better um, understanding of the diversity of projects that we create so that our staff is better trained and better able to respond to the um, capital program that we have. Uh, anaerobic digesters are, of course, fantastic things. So we're, we're nearing capacity at uh, Durham. So our intention is to begin the design to build another one. And of course, this will give us uh, an opportunity to potentially expand our fog program, the fats, oils, and grease program there, while that digester um, grows to meet the, the needs of the community. Uh, mentioned primary clarifiers earlier today on the capital slide. And you see that we're also building them at uh, Forest Grove. I mentioned the water reuse and expanding our program there. Again, the distribution system is mentioned, and of course, the occupied building projects at uh, Ripple and Springer. Two things. Um, uh, one is, uh, for those of you who are newish on CWAC, I thought the East Basin Master Plan was really cool. I learned <coughs> uh, from the scenarios that were in there. So this is not boring work. Uh, so thank you in advance uh, for digging into it. Uh, then the other thing is both on this slide as well as the picture that had Rock Creek. Um, I'm really, I don't know Rock Creek as well excuse me, as Durham, because I haven't visited Rock Creek in a while. I need to. Uh, but what my note is all about is it's impressive how your team has maximized the footprint of the treatment plants. And it would be interesting sometime in our learning sessions uh, on slide 106, you show us Rock Creek. It would be interesting to see in your archives or catalog what similar 
what that looked like 20 years ago, 10 years ago now. Uh, because it, it shows us pic through pictures how things have changed and helps us as well as ratepayers understand the incredible cost-effective work you've done. <clears throat> Just, and also, I love how you've got the public tours going. I saw that announcement, I can't remember where, so thank you. I know I haven't promoted it on social media yet, but really cool. I always like to say it's better than a tour of Disneyland because you get to touch and feel the rides, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Let me think about that. You get to touch it. <laughs> I guess I might be the only one who thinks that. Yeah. Portland issued golden tickets to come to mm -hmm. community to come and see their facilities. That was a brilliant marketing it idea. Really Absolutely brilliant really idea, and well worth a golden ticket. Um, oh, I did forget to mention if you if you I'm sorry I forgot this, but uh, for WRD the budget began on page 287. Sorry for. Forgetting to skip over that. That tells us that. This was the right place. To <laughs> <laughs> All right, then uh, if we'll go to the next slide. I, uh, I, have, a, I, have, yes. I have a question. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm having a little trouble prying my HR hat off, but uh, I noticed that you've got 118 employee FTEs in this, in this group. Mm -hmm. And uh, your overtime costs went up by 10 percent and is is that a reflection of having difficulty filling positions again absolutely yeah okay it I just wanted to is. put another little spot thank you on that. and I really appreciated your comments earlier and and then also I noticed in the in the detail you talked about the cost of chemicals going up mm -hmm. but at the bottom of that char of the of the page it's really interesting to look at the impact of the cost of those chemicals that are listed there over the course of um, from uh, 21 to now. I mean, it's, it is significant, and we're talking about large amounts of money here. So. It, it is very significant, and actually as a result of this, we're going to be changing uh, one of our business um, processes to improve the efficiency by which we not only identify our chemical use, but then uh, account for it and pay for it that will be occurring. Uh, the, the, the directors will see this, I believe, coming through um, July, August-ish for a major change that will occur in the fall of uh, this calendar year. Well, it was, I, I certainly heard the message about mm -hmm. the chemical costs going up, but when you look at it and the, see the, the, the millions, I mean, it's, it starts making an impact. Mm -hmm. Huge double-digit increases. So, Logan, you have two NSDSC members that I thought would be great if you could introduce. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Matt Veneman, right? Yep. Who okay. was just in front Matt of us on Tuesday, yeah, too. That's right. Thank you. <clears throat> See you again. And Jill Erickson with NSES. Oh, yes. yes. We saw you at one of our learning days. <laughs> <laughs> the bug lady. The bug lady. <laughs> Matt is responsible for projects within NSES, and Jill is responsible for stewardship within NSES. Cool. All right, now I'm really nervous because they're sitting behind me, and they'll, they'll make faces at me. You <laughs> better be. <laughs> There's no popcorn throwing here. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you'll turn to page, or if you'd like to, if you turn to page uh, 239 in your budget, uh, you'll see that's where the NSES budget begins. And uh, next slide. Uh, personnel services has uh, increased. Uh, NSES went through a restructuring and reclassification of many of the positions, uh, and also shifting elements of the capital program to the operational program. And some of those associated personnel costs are reflected in that 21% increase. Uh, you may recall earlier there was a shift of $433,000 um, from NSES related to um, communications and community education. Uh, that's why you see the uh, reduction in the materials and services budget that's there. So overall that results in a 7% in a change to your budget. Uh, you can see here the uh, different functional areas, landscape strategies, uh, planning, 
uh, project delivery. Of course, Matt is here and stewardship uh, with Jill. And I'll move forward to the next slide. Landscape strategies. Uh, there are so many interesting aspects of what NSES does. It's, it's difficult. Uh, so there are a number of bullets uh, that are here. Suffice it to say, they're one of our more diverse programs uh, that's directly involved in uh, our, what I would call our watershed program, uh, more so, of course, than our gray infrastructure. And because of that, it requires uh, unique tools, assets, including unique staff to ensure that uh, those programs meet success. So as it relates to the, the landscape strategies, you can see integrating the natural systems with our stormwater requirements. And as you can imagine, uh, as the area continues to urbanize, it's critically important that we ensure that we maintain the natural systems even as urbanization continues to occur. Um, remotely sensing data, that's critical because we can't always have all the staff that we want to be out there. So we have to work smarter, right? Not harder. And uh, what I've also really appreciated is the collaboration between NSES and the reuse program, understanding how those two can mutually benefit one another, the ability to take reuse water and improve natural lands as a result of that, including the, the soil biology. It's, uh, it's pretty neat stuff. And of course, uh, their involvement in, as all of our programs are, in really truly meeting the, the key strategic outcomes that are associated with our roadmaps and, and focus areas. So for NSCS, I wanted uh, to be specific. As part of the roadmaps, each of them has an operational focus. And I thought it was, it was really meaningful to include them uh, in this presentation. So planning integrated conservation strategies that assemble the resources and partnerships needed for a healthy and resilient watershed. And understand, when we say partnerships, that's not just external, that's also internal. So it's pretty neat. Uh, next slide. Can oh. I ask a question? Sure. So uh, being at the Tualatin City, uh, City of Tualatin State of the County, I was reminded of their B City USA status mm -hmm. and how that one of the things it means uh, in addition to backyard habitat uh, within the city's operations, looking at their use of chemicals, the type of chemicals, and the timing of those chemicals for like parks applications. So it reminded me of while I was a Metro counselor hearing studies on NPR about species collapse and climate mm -hmm. change and things accelerating and messing up migration and the interdependency of index insects as food for different bird species. Whew. So where this is all going is I appreciate the work that you're doing at the landscape level for temperature and water quality. Who in the ecosystem of all things stewardship and so forth I'm assuming as a layperson that it's not just about bees, but it may be about other uh, insects that we need to be sensitive to. And as you're doing your plantings or your stewardship, I'm wondering if there might be other species that we want to uh, support investment in because it helps for the continuation of species or at least helps give them a boost as we as humans continue to challenge. I, what I don't know is if there's anything we might willingly invest in beyond our own what we need to do for water quality and temperature. I just love that question and I brought Jill up. Wasn't to the very table. crisply asked. No, I'm it's sorry. a great question, right? Because we have our utility work that we do and that any NSES expands that, right? Mm -hmm. Through the partnerships 
that they create so that we can do more than just a utility alone. And we've had different projects over the years to look at the pollinators and the planting communities. But I thought, I don't know, I thought this would be a great comment for Jill to make. It, and perhaps another way I could have asked it, and I'm not trying to change the question, is I've certainly, in my adult lifetime, I've come to appreciate the migration. Well, and I moved here from the East Coast, so I had to learn more about the migration patterns between the North and the South, right? Um, and um, I don't know if you already have permission, are enabled to work with whoever worries about that migration pattern. You know, honestly, the, the simplest answer is that where we focus on the projects, the enhancement projects that we're planning in the landscape strategies and putting in the ground and project delivery, is that they're all these really, really well-balanced ecosystems. And so we, you don't have to think about a plant or a bug or a species or their migration. If you're very thoughtful and adaptive and you build a system okay. that functions, which is what we focus on, then, then all of those things fall into place. And there's this really famous um, Japanese saying that if you have a healthy river, you have a healthy community, mm -hmm. is how it translates. So when you're thinking about the function of those systems, we're focused on our requirements, meeting our shade credit, being in compliance. But if you do it right, then something like emerald ash borer comes along and, and wipes out your ash trees or damages them, but you have diversity. So you have resilient systems. I want to, I'm gonna play the skeptic here though. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a scale, doing things satisfactorily and doing them excellently. I don't know if we have asked you to just make sure you're a little bit better of satisfactory versus excellent. And it's, it's my human fear factor for the stresses that we can only imagine now. With our shade program, I would say we are a model to do it excellently because we're able to reach biodiversity. There are other programs that just plant a monoculture of trees on the south side of the, the river. We don't do that. And, and that's really um, because of the expertise that okay. um, the team has over at NSCS and, and it's our objective. When we do something, it's ecologically um, correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. It's truly ecosystem-based. Okay. Absolutely. And I, I better I understand it. Thank comment you. to that because um, this is a conversation I, I had years ago with Bruce Roll and, and yeah. other folks, and I think it is fair to say that Clean Water Services shade credit work can't do everything. For example, something like 70% of our native bees are ground nesters, and open ground doesn't help with the temperature requirements or what we're trying to do with temperature. But on the other hand, the piece that the um, vegetation program does is shrubs, even many trees, um, provide really important floral resources and nutrition for pollinators. So, you know, we can't, I don't think we can get everything, you know, but it does a lot, you know, and maybe the rest can be a future eco roof on the ABC building or something for some of those other needs. But anyway. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These little bugs. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Next slide. I just. Yeah, the revet. There we go. Matt's group. Okay. Um, uh, this is Matt's group, and uh, again, project delivery. So, uh, uh, revegetation of stream corridors uh, to support the temperature management plan. We just discussed some of those elements. Uh, I hope is I hope everyone here is familiar with the Balm Grove Dam removal project. Uh, that one is really neat. 
of the new? No, that is actually uh, stream corridor support, I believe, in the top, the top picture that's there. I do believe we have one coming up, though, of uh, the Balm Grove, Grove Dam uh, project, yes. And what is he holding? Or I'm assuming that that's a, fish? a salmonid. Mm -hmm. a, a baby, a baby fish. fish. Yes. And of course, uh, it's been wonderful. If any of you have had the chance to head out towards Gaston and see Wapato Lake and how it has changed so much in <clears throat> such a short period of time, it's really remarkable out there to see the changes. So uh, again, it's it's fantastic. And then as always, uh, identifying oppor potential opportunities for water banking and uh, in-stream leasing of those supplies. Uh, Matt's team, again, project delivery to support multidisciplinary partnerships to design and implement urban and rural projects that support a healthy and resilient watershed. You'll notice partnership is a common theme within NSES. Uh, next slide. And Jill's group, uh, stewardship services. I often think of, of uh, Jill's group very similar to the uh, operations of the resource recovery facilities. These are the day-to-day -day operators to make sure everything runs the way it should. So of course, uh, exploring partnerships to reduce the cost of long-term maintenance of investments. The uh, uh, comment earlier about adapting to changes that will be coming as a result of the emerald ash borer coming to, uh, coming to Oregon. And of course, one of the, the most interesting aspects is that bottom one, identify climate analog regions for ecological resilience. So the team is currently evaluating the Humboldt region in Northern California and evaluating plants that are there with the idea that we may be shifting our plant pallets, ensuring that we have that resilient system uh, to be able to respond not just to the loss of the ash trees, but also to uh, climate change. Again, operational focus, uh, cost effectively manage the plant materials for CWS vegetation projects and maintain established enhancement areas to ensure regulatory compliance with the temperature management plan. Boy, that's a mouthful, but it means an awful lot, yeah. Um, so this is where having a foot in each agency uh, is exciting for me. So we're. We were just talking on Tuesday, I think, about how we were nearing the end of the affordable housing bond program at, in terms of letting the dollars for new construction, uh, but it won't be all constructed until the end of 2025, 26 or so. Um, but I, I would be interested in, I know all those projects have to pass all the permitting but I don't know how we might go after a grant or whatever to have one of you certifiably smart natural systems people or somebody else go and do a complete portfolio review of Washington County, Hillsboro, and Beaverton's affordable housing projects from this standpoint of both surface water management as well as uh, do we have enough greenery for humans and nature uh, before we look at another round of them? It would be a great um, multidisciplinary project that um, RUSD through planning would take that look and engage all the other team members. So we'll add it to a list. We don't have an initiative like that, so. And we would need to start working on it so that we have the recommendations out of that in order to look at how we um, make choices and investments in shaping any potential future bond measure. So that'd be a, a good one to, to scope out. I do want to give a shout out to NSES. When you look at all of the departments and the program uh, roadmaps, they do a beautiful job. They're very much strategic thinkers and um, thinking about how to move strategies forward. So I did want to tell that the Rich Hunter's not here, but Jill and Matt, very Yay. thoughtful, very beautiful.
Any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, related to uh, capital planning of NSES projects, uh, again, they do support conveyance engineering and field operations uh, with different projects, revegetating areas uh, when we go in and replace uh, conveyance lines. Uh, currently, there are 16 sanitary projects uh, totaling about 6.3 million. Uh, 5.6 million are related to temperature management, and there's another about 2 million for surface water management projects. And you can see that excellent graphic showing how those dollars are distributed. And if you're interested uh, in your capital budget, the smaller one, you can go to pages 9 and 10, as well as pages 263 to 264 to see the individual projects associated uh, with NSES. And with that, we'll move to the next slide. Enhancement by the numbers. Are there any final questions or comments? Okay, next Elaine. one from Elaine. Yeah. Oh, Elaine, yes. Um, it looks like Jack left, and I think he was the one who said you were thinking about consolidating construction project management. Oh, was that? Okay. Well, anyway, um, I'm thinking about some of the hiccups that we had in having some of our capital projects include some of our revegetation work because capital projects um, need to adhere to um, Davis Bacon. What's the yes. word? Yes. Mm -hmm. Davis Bacon. Um, mm -hmm. And many of our most experienced contractors with the best track records mm -hmm. of getting actual vegetation established, we had existing contracts with them that we could not use because they were under farm and forestry rules instead. And so I don't know if that's an issue for you folks, but it might be something to be aware of because with large capital projects, when you are pairing like that, you don't always get the right talent at the right place at the right time. And that's what we've been innovating on. So Cedar Mill North Johnson is an example. So the capital project goes through, and NSES now is doing the restoration work and doing okay. it the way that they um, would do it that takes advantage of all that. I really okay. appreciate that comment, yes. The, the action our board took on Tuesday, which Matt was here for, was also looking at a different type of contracting methodology related to landscape and restoration services mm -hmm. based on an RFQ rather than a low bid kind of, mm -hmm. but because of the pretty unique nature of that type yeah. of work. And we've used uh, that approach for probably the last 10 years, I think, and we just re-upped it again, the board did on Tuesday. Yeah, because those good ones are worth their weight in gold. Yes, oh goodness. Yeah. It's also about educating our team members as well as what the internal assets are. And this is also, uh, again, the earlier slides related to our integrated planning effort and making certain that there is good communication internally to identify those opportunities and where we can't do it in-house, ensure that it's done in a manner that meets our criteria. So there, there is definitely a lot of innovation that's occurring in that area. And it's really neat. Um, uh, I, I'm going to go off script here. But um, it's just, it's been three years and a couple of weeks uh, since I began working for Clean Water Services. And uh, what I personally experienced in that time has been transformative as it relates to the spirit of collaboration which we've seen, especially in the, the last year or so, something like that. The, the foundation was laid, but between the, the strategic planning elements, uh, the implementation of uh, the road mapping exercise for all of the groups, the communication that's been surrounding that, I think it's been really healthy to expose, well, you know, we have some opportunities here to improve, but then there's also these really good strategic partnerships and uh, we've planted those seeds, we've watered them, we're starting to see the sprouts taking place. And I just think that um, based on the level of, of collaboration and uh, just unique projects that are out there for us, that we're just gonna continue to improve and see more and more of that as time comes. Okay, oh, yes. Uh, Utility operations and services uh, for uh, those members that were able to attend the board learning day. This is uh, the field ops uh, team, as well as uh, conveyance engineering. So if we go to the next slide. 
It's the fun stuff. <laughs> it's all fun. <laughs> it is all fun. It's, uh, it's one of those where it's always so much fun. Where do you focus your time when you want to do all of it all of the time? Yeah. Uh, okay. There were a uh, conversion of two temporary positions that uh, provide flagging duties. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, we use flagging because a number of the activities occur in um, active roadways. We want to make certain that our staff is safe. Typically, those were always um, outsourced, but what we've learned in the last several years is that we're using so much of it that we believe it's more cost effective to bring that uh, in-house. In and also uh, implementation, of course, of the uh, labor agreement. Uh, are largely what led to that increase in the 15% the there. Under uh, materials and services, we're very excited. Uh, we're thinking about our sewer shed, much the same way that we think about our resource recovery facilities. How do we interact with them? Did uh, you say sewer ship? Sewer shed. Sewer shed. Sewer shed. Okay. So when you think of a, uh, a watershed, uh, we also think of something as a sewer shed. And there are ways uh, that we can make our sewer, set, sewer shed smarter. <laughs> Say that quickly. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's a really great time to reevaluate technologies that we've re relied on for decades to make certain that they still meet our needs for the future, as well as ensure that uh, the information that we're gathering is both accurate and precise. Because as Diane alluded to, if we're replacing 40-year-old concrete pipes, they're not even middle-aged yet, right? They should last 100 years. And uh, we want to make certain that the decisions that we're making will ensure that we get the longest longevity out of that infrastructure as possible because it's really costly to replace. So this is where uh, a smart sewer shed can help with um, identifying where investing in I&I &I is perhaps more beneficial than in increasing the size of the pipes or increasing the size of uh, the treatment works. Because again, remember, resource recovery facilities, they want carbon. They don't want H2O, right? So it's the carbon is what they're designed to process and the waste associated with that. Um, so there's some really unique opportunities. So part of this increase in cost here is also a uh, flow monitoring master plan, which will lead to uh, some I think some really interesting opportunities for, uh, for the district. Uh, one of the interesting elements when you look at this is some of the changes um, just to the overall departmental budgets, 16, 10, 13, um, and then the, the 15. And based on where we are this year, we want to revisit um, how, this, how our field operations program is, is capitalizing their work. Uh, recently, uh, in the last year, the board supported the creation of two superintendent positions uh, within field operations, and we will be able to utilize these staff to better understand the, the business of what's occurring and ensure that the supervisors there are, are trained in implementing uh, good financial practices associated with the projects that they do. So we will be uh, looking into that further over the coming year and more fun with spreadsheets and those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, could you remind me how many operational facilities you have? Oh my goodness. No, what I mean, uh, field ops, like. Oh, where the crews are based? Yes. Okay, uh, two. Currently, uh, one of our construction crews and some ancillary field operations staff are located at the Ripple building, which they need to move because there's demolition work scheduled. They will be moving into temporary facilities, trailers located at uh, Springer Street where the materials handling yard is. There's a vacant lot and a storage building across the way that is going to be expanded to serve um, the construction crews. And then of course, uh, Merlot Court, where the bulk of the field operations crew as well as UOPS um, engineering is currently um, housed. Okay. And Logan may not know, they have a Cherry Street facility. Yes, yes, there's a Cherry Street and I was thinking there's another one I recently, uh -huh. I can't remember the name. For storage storage. Of, of materials because yes. when they work far out, they, they have a place to store. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, you can see here the uh, distribution, 14 FTEs located in uh, conveyance engineering responsible for largely the engineering tasks associated with uh, not just maintaining our conveyance system but also building our, our conveyance system as uh, growth occurs. 
Uh, and then, of course, the field operations, system repair, maintenance, TV and flow monitoring, uh, repairs of all sorts of different issues, as well as maintenance of the uh, stormwater, surface water facilities. Uh, next slide. Project delivery, uh, Metzger, Metzger Trunk, Ash Creek is uh, both Metzger and Fano are very significant projects that were identified as part of the East Basin master planning process. And uh, again, as part of the West Basin master planning process, uh, uh, addressing North Hillsboro and the potential growth in that area are pretty key. The uh, uh, strategic asset management program, what this means is that uh, largely we've been focusing on a prescriptive. Uh, we're going to televise um, all of our lines. And for perspective, uh, Clean Water Services uh, between our um, uh, conveyance system and our stormwater system, if you put those pipelines end to end, it would go from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine. So this is a lot of pipeline that's, and that's just our part, let alone the cities, the county, you know, what, the, what they have, whatever, what they maintain. Um, so what we've been doing historically is evaluating, well, we need to do X number of uh, miles of pipeline per year. And we've identified sections that we're doing that don't necessarily need to be inspected at quite that frequency. So what we want to start building is truly a, a strategic asset management program. If we only need to televise that line once every 10 years, well, let's work towards a program that gets us to that point so that we can spend more time focusing on areas where we do know uh, that we have issues and be able to ensure that we're focusing there rather than, um, you know, I, I'm not going to say we're, we're doing this, but say check the box, we did it, and then rush off to the next one because the focus is on production rather than resolving issues. We don't want to get into that uh, mindset. So that's what we mean by uh, strategic. Uh, rebuilding staffing assets and training. I just mentioned uh, the uh, with conveyance, uh, there's been some changeover in staff and we, again, very hard to fill positions. It's a tough job market art out there. So continuing to, to do that. And uh, collaboration opportunities. We just talked about NSES, and uh, thank you for your comments about let's ensure that we do these things sequentially so that we can maximize. Because you know, when you think about it, if you only replace a, an interceptor once every hundred years, uh, and you can go, and you are able to go in there and do the revegetation re plan correctly at the outset, that's a hundred years of opportunity right there. So it's a good thing. Uh, stormwater planning, Bull Mountain, King City, and of course, uh, Aloha, where we see a lot of I and I inflow and infiltration issues. So those are going to be key focuses of the upcoming years related to planning. And this, is that, that's stormwater. Okay, so local, regional, doesn't matter, question mark? That's in the unincorporated mm -hmm. area. So that's local. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Okay, next slide. And field operations. So we were discussing conveyance engineering, and of course they work closely together. Uh, cleaning sewer and storm lines. I mentioned the proactive versus the prescriptive. So again, the two teams working together to identify how can we do this collaboratively to ensure we're investing in our resources in the right manner. Uh, continuing to identify uh, I and I opportunities and how we think about that to ensure that we're um, all in alignment. I mentioned the televising, visual inspections, and of course I mentioned uh, the flow monitoring uh, master plan. We discussed uh, opportunities for collaboration. Again, uh, the superintendent role we anticipate will be transformative for the field operations to make certain that they are fully integrated with the other operational teams as well as business services teams within clean water services. The superintendent will be key to help uh, ensuring that those opportunities will occur and uh, that they will be implemented. And what was that great phrase I learned today? Um, Which one? About uh, implementation. Oh, it's just a hallucination. Hallucination, yes. <laughs> Would you mind restating that again? Strategies are. Yeah, strategies and visions are just hallucinations unless you can implement them. <laughs> I love yes. that, by the way. Isn't that I fantastic? Heard you say yeah. earlier, and I was like, that's brilliant. That is. <laughs> And I think you're, uh, there's a real opportunity between conveyance engineering and the field operations teams to 
implement in ways that they have not been able to in the past in this coming year and, and hopefully years to come uh, as a result of that uh, focus in this area. So it's an exciting time in, in this uh, program as well. Uh, we talked about improving uh, communication and this again, how do we ensure that the data that we're gathering is meaningful, that it provides not just information, but information that's utilized to ensure we make good decisions and then partnering with uh, digital solutions to improve service and workflow issues. I think what you've seen uh, in this presentation today, or I hope what you've seen has come through, is the continuous crossover between the departments, whether it's business services or operations. There's a lot of collaboration that's occurring now between the groups to ensure that we're being as effective as possible. And I also like to think about it as in terms of alignment, making certain that when we that the the roadmaps, that the key strategic outcomes, that people understand that these aren't just terms that relate to an executive level, that it's that it is meaningful and it directly impacts the work that um, staff do at all levels in the organization. So it's pretty neat. Uh, next slide. Any questions? Yeah. On street sweeping, do you do that across the entire region of Washington County or only in the UUAs? Street sweeping is focused on curbs yep. in the UAAs. It's a local service. So the cities provide their own street sweeping and some do enhanced levels because they're doing it for transportation reasons. Um, so yes, ours is a local service. Whereas the others are all regional. So big diameter pipe work, yep. teeing and all of that, that's regional. Small diameter work, that's local. Yep. Yeah. But like manhole rehabilitation. Uh, that's a regional service because the other communities want us to support that work. Yeah, the manhole rehab program. Yep. Catch basins, are those only in the UUAs? Um, pretty much in the UAAs. The cities have a lot of capability <coughs> with their catch basins. Yep. And uh, re the rehab of pipes, those are big and little, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I want to call um, just a moment of kind of where we are here. Thank you, Director Fye. On our published agenda, we said there was an opportunity for public comment at 210, which we are past that. Um, I just want to make sure that we note that and ask for that public comment. And then obviously, I think we'll want one at the end of the meeting as well. So with that, I will hand it over to Kevin, I think. Thank you, Mark. Would any members in our auditorium wish to provide public comment for up to two minutes on what you've heard from the functional areas so far? Not seeing anyone raise hands or come forward. Would any member viewing this meeting via Zoom like to provide public comment on what you've heard for up to two minutes to the budget committee? Not seeing any additional hands. Do we have any viewers out? Any on Zoom? Uh, we, we have we have two people logged in on Zoom. Uh, we have last report 14 viewing the CWS YouTube channel and 11 viewing the county's YouTube channel. Oh, cool, sweet. Thank you, Logan. Thank you. And moving on uh, to Enterprise Asset and Technical Services Department. Uh, this is definitely one of our our most diverse programs, provides a, a number of services to the district. Uh, next line. Uh, you will see some significant increases in personnel services as well as materials and services. One of the reasons for this, uh, 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 Director Treese, is related to that staffing issue. There, have, there are several positions which are critically difficult to fill in this, and we've tried for quite some time. We've reached the conclusion that this next year that uh, it's necessary to increase contracted services. Mm -hmm. So what we have is essentially a double count. So if there's a, pos a position we're able to fill it, then we won't need as much of the contracted services. If we're not able to fill that position, then the contracted services dollars are there to um, come in and fill that. I, I noticed in the, in the last section, there was, I think it was professional services, the increase was 7,600% or something. And is that what you're talking about right there, as well as I think it's 2,400% in this one? 
Yes, if we, we win the at, prize on well, pers on on the number on the yeah. amount of percentage increase, <laughs> and, and that's why you see here the materials and services cost uh, pretty consistent. Actual two point one million revised budget for this fiscal year two point three, and it's proposed at three point two. So there's essentially nine hundred thousand dollar increase right there. And and I'm really glad that we're talking about that that it's yes. out in the open. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, Four staff were added mid-year uh, to this program, so you're, you're seeing that uh, two of those positions we were able to fill, two we were not, so you're able to see the full cost coming on there. That's part of the reason for the increase in the personnel services. Uh, again, we're also, uh, we mentioned earlier the discussion about resetting the baseline. Uh, the team has done a great job in uh, improving the asset management uh, focus uh, with clean water services to involve the uh, WRRD superintendents, and this has led to a significant increases in our R and R repair and replacement budgets. And uh, this this staff is uh, integral to ensuring the success of those projects. So, again, our facilities are aging. Uh, what you'll notice is uh, typically you'll see facilities kind of cruise along, cruise along for about 20 years, and then the costs just start going way, way up. And you have to maintain those facilities because. Uh, uh, they're not going anywhere, right? And yet they still need to meet that same level, if not more difficult, uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, so we're at that phase in our uh, aging infrastructure where the costs are definitely going up on the existing assets. And it's, of course, couldn't be at a worse time when we have supply chain issues, um, inflation, um, all of those. It's, it's all compounding. It's really hitting us. Uh, this also uh, reflects the creation of the facilities program and uh, the transfer of staff from other departments. So you'll see uh, fiscal year 22, 25 staff, uh, fiscal year 23, revised budget 32, 24, proposed 34. And you may recall I mentioned uh, the transfer of two of the uh, maintenance positions from the resource recovery facilities to, uh, program to the facilities program. Uh, next slide. Uh, as we just spoke about, uh, asset management, uh, condition assessment, predictive maintenance, these are key foundational elements to ensure that we stay on top of our planning uh, for all of our assets. Uh, there's well over 14,000 different individual assets uh, that have to be maintained and tracked. Uh, facilities maintenance, all of the occupied buildings uh, were extremely pleased with uh, facilities and uh, we have a focus program on our roofs now, uh, which is fantastic, right? Because you don't necessarily want water getting in on top of all of your expensive equipment, right? <clears throat> and uh, as well as our HVAC assets and ensuring that we have standard uh, systems there because as earlier with the heat dome, the increasing temperatures during the summer, a lot of that electrical equipment needs to be kept at a cooler temperature, otherwise it starts to fail and, and you have issues. So our facilities maintenance team is, is going, doing a great job there. Uh, technical support, again, uh, fantastic program, uh, responsible for evaluating not just our uh, new capital infrastructure that's being proposed on the electrical and instrumentation side, but also commenting on the R&R &R projects and individual issues that, that uh, come up. And I can name a number of different examples, but I'll, I'll move on. Uh, control systems. Uh, SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data a Acquisition is what SCADA means, and it's uh, a foundational program that we use to constantly monitor and track what's occurring real time with our assets. So uh, how much flow is going through a facility, how many times a pump has been run, uh, how that pump runs or what switches on where. It's, uh, it's used throughout our facilities, our resource recovery facilities, to ensure that operations can be at many different places at once and yet always know what's occurring within the plants themselves, as well as you can be at Forest Grove and know what's occurring at the tr plant in Durham. You know, some, some neat uh, abilities there. And the safety program, which is critical. Uh, I still recall reading decades ago in one of my operations manuals that uh, our industry used to be the second most dangerous occupation in the United States behind coal mining. And uh, my time in the industry since uh, 1992, 
I have seen really significant changes and improvements in the focus on safety again and again and again to now I'm not even sure where we would be ranked uh, as, as industries, but I'm just glad that we're no longer number two, right? Even though we have fun with number two. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, operational readiness. Uh, Asset management of uh, existing equipment. So our computerized maintenance uh, management system is what we utilize to uh, determine, well, it's time to go out and perform service on these particular assets and uh, what's their condition, record their conditions so that we can monitor them over the time. Uh, think about it as your maintenance plan for your automobile and you take it into a dealership. In this case, uh, all of the technicians are located on site. They have the same uh, knowledge based on the manufacturer's recommendations about when you go out and maintain this equipment and we utilize this tool to ensure that we're doing that. Uh, root cause programs, if we do have a failure, especially one that was unforeseen, uh, wasn't caught, uh, understanding what led to it and having the diagnostic tools to help determine uh, the particular cause. Because again, our equipment is rather expensive and, and most of it is capitalized. So it exceeds that $5,000 and three years uh, criteria. So we wanna make sure that uh, we maintain it as best as we possibly can. Uh, asset management of the facilities, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning program. Also the uh, prioritizing of our replacement and renewal projects. Uh, it's, it's really neat to see so much ownership occur and accountability at the same time. Uh, ownership because staff really loves doing these R&R projects and uh, the accountability and making certain that they're done effectively as, as they're implemented. So it's been great to see that program grow. Uh, next slide. Automation and controls. Uh, this is actually pretty neat. This is an, an area where we're seeing some significant collaboration between our controls team and digital solutions as we think about uh, the redundant servers. So again, as we think about emergency preparedness and uh, ensuring that a facility can be interconnected, but it can also operate independently if there's a catastrophe that occurs. Uh, this relates to the in network infrastructure as well and the uh, communication loops. Uh, some, some pretty neat stuff that's going on there. Uh, the SCADA network improvements. Uh, SCADA is constantly, because it's, it's integral to everything we do, there's, there's tweaks and there's changes that needs to occur. There's ensuring that we have uniformity across our facilities, which uh, uh, you, is always a bit challenging when you have so many different folks that uh, have different opinions about how a SCADA system should be operated. And I feel for our control services and technical services teams as they try and step into the middle of some of those um, rather opinionated discussions, but they, they manage it and they do a great job. And of course, uh, the continued support of our capital improvement plan. Uh, next slide. Uh, expanding the uh, local safety committee program uh, to inc include the administrative building complex, ABC, uh, the, where the laboratory is currently housed. And uh, we have a, a program currently within WRD, another one at Field Ops, and uh, we'd like to expand that further to uh, incorporate ABC and other programs, as well as uh, an improved job safety analysis program. Because we have facilities located in uh, different areas and you can have different teams that may not even see each other, but yet they're collaborating on a particular job, and say you have a job that's low frequency but high danger, that's where your risk of injury is the greatest. So what we want to do is make certain that the communication is the best that it can be and that there's cross checks. And this is uh, what a job safety analysis does is it says, Hey, here's this unique position. Uh, the staff recognizes it's unique over here. The staff recognizes it's unique over here. Let's make certain that they're communicating and um, allocating their resources, whether it's staffing or equipment, uh, to ensure that the safety of all staff as well as the facilities are, are maintained. So that's, uh, that's a good program as well. Uh, next slide. Whoop. Okay. So it just so happens that this picture and this whole topic is on page 212 and also touches on the next slide with some of the numbers. So these 84 unoccupied buildings, you mean they're not occupied by humans, they're occupied by equipment. Equipment, machinery, pieces yeah. and parts, okay. all of those, yes. Okay, so 
It might be like a pump station. I don't 44 know. pump stations. Uh, it could be uh, our solids handling buildings, uh, the digester buildings that are there, uh, yeah. tunnels, yeah. Uh, all sorts of structures that we have. The uh, Ostara buildings, you know, those those types of structures. Okay, yes. thank you. Of course. That's a great question. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, really good question. Well, they're not, I know there's a nuance between empty and unoccupied, right? And it's just, uh, it's for a layperson like me, you forget that equipment needs protection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a new vocabulary term, huh? Instead mm -hmm. of occupied and unoccupied, it's some of our people centric buildings and others are treatment mm -hmm. process, but yeah. So I, I want to ask a point of order here. Um, we have two more departments. I thought maybe we could take a break now and come back at 3 o'clock if people are up for that. And I think we would be on schedule to be wrapped up by probably 4 o'clock. I'm okay with that. Okay, do you want to take a break then? Yeah. Okay. Morgan's going to head off. I'm yes, I can, thank I you. Can stay until 4, but until I need four. to. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Tried to, thank you for your understanding. I felt like the, um, uh, the legal disclaimer on a radio ad. But I hope that uh, we're able to get through the material and oh. answer your questions. Thank you very much for your time today. Mark, I have a, I, I'll need to leave by four. Okay. Sit. Okay. Thank you. So 15 minute break? 15 minute break. Well, actually now it's 13. 13. Well, 13 yeah. minute break. <laughs> You know I'm going to be rounding you up. <clears throat> Bob, you want to sit here? You were eliminated. I did. I retired about a year ago. Okay. And what department was that? I was in the parks.
Okay, why don't we go ahead and why don't we go ahead and uh, reconvene here? I think that there's. I understand there may be a pool among staff about when it this when we're completed. Some people are trying to influence the end. Um, so I'm waiting for directors Willie and Fi. So what I'd like to do is, boy, this can be perfect timing. Are we back live? Oh, we're gonna be. Oh, look at this. We have 43 seconds. You want to go back out and get a Diet Coke, or no, you don't. <laughs> what? Oh, 84. Got it. You're sauntering, Jerry. What? You're sauntering. Seconds. I know. <laughs> so we have taken we have taken this. Uh, uh, thank you for accommodating the change, and thank you, Logan, Friday. for doing that. Um, Normally, we were going to do all the business service functional areas first and then go to the operation. We, we, we stuck Logan in there. So these uh, last two presentations for regional utility services and regulatory affairs are also in the business services functional area. Um, they were standalone departments before this year, too, but they're in that area. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to the team. What? We are ready. All right. We are back. Good afternoon, Chair Song and other committee members. My name is Joe Gall. I'm the Chief Utility Relations Officer for Clean Water Services. I'm here to briefly discuss the proposed budget for the Regional Utility Services Department, also known as RUSD. For reference in your budget book, our department description begins on page 175. RUSD is responsible for customer relations, economic development, and community planning, and utility intergovernmental relations. Our proposed budget for RUSD is a moderate increase for the next fiscal year, as you can see from this graphic on the screen. We are not proposing any changes to our current staffing level. We have been fortunate over this past year in that our 34 FTE positions have largely been fully filled, especially over the second half of this current fiscal year. I'm going to your comment earlier, that has been a big morale boost for my team because when all the seats are filled, it's amazing you can actually get through your workload much, much easier. So we have one vacant position currently that we're hoping to fill in our inspection team. Diane alluded to this. We had a new construction supervisor that we uh, lured out here from the Kansas City area. He only spent six months. He's a great, great employee. The city of North Plains snagged him as their uh, next public works director, which is a great opportunity for we him. We need to do something about that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, but overall, as you can see in the slide, we are proposing a very moderate 7% increase in our department budget uh, compared from the current year. Next slide. There are three programs within RUSD. Our administration program, program includes our two division managers. Damon Reishi and Andy Braun. Both Damon and Andy are seasoned, knowledgeable leaders who have been with our district for nearly two decades, and I'm fortunate to have them lead their respective programs within the department. Damon leads our development services program, which includes 27 FTE. This division provides a number of services, I won't go through all of them, but I'll touch on a few, including regional services to the entire service area, including various environmental reviews, and regional support of plan review and construction inspection across our co-implementer partner cities for consistency with design and construction standards. Two local program services related to permitting of private development within the unincorporated area and the cities of Banks, Durham, Gaston, King City, and North Plains. And finally, administration of the private stormwater quality facility inspection program. Andy Braun leads our systems planning program, which includes five FTE. This program leads the regional integration of capital planning and analysis across our service area, <clears throat> coordinates interagency capital improvement design and construction, and helps integrate developer constructed infrastructure to assure capacity for growth in both the sanitary and stormwater systems. Next slide, please. One of the critical projects that RUSD has been leading since late 2021 
is the development of new intergovernmental agreements, or IGAs, with our two largest city partners, Hillsborough and Beaverton. Both of these cities requested new agreements be negotiated back in June 2021, which also coincides with my arrival to Clean Water Services as the first ever Chief Utility Relations Officer. As larger cities with more resources available, these two cities are seeking a new relationship with Clean Water Services. Both want to take on more responsibility for sanitary and stormwater activities within their respective jurisdictions while still working effectively with CWS to co-implement our NPDES permit requirements. We have spent a large amount of time with staff within each city talking through the various components of our operating partnership, listening and learning from each other along the way. Like so many organizations, there are many new people in new roles at both cities, so it has been a very healthy, informative process to learn about the many different ways that we partner and work together. In addition to our USD staff, this process has involved staff from across many departments within Clean Water Services, including regulatory affairs, finance, field operations, and our legal team. We are now at the important phase of drafting the new IGA language with both cities with the target of completing the final draft by July. While I'm excited that we will have a new updated and refreshed agreement with both cities soon, the real long-term benefit from this effort will be the strengthened relationships and mutual understanding of the value of our partnership with these two cities. That is the real div dividend I see for the future with both cities. Next slide. But your, whoop, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Your work doesn't stop. No. Okay. No. Okay. Um, that, after the final drafts are complete, we will go for board approval. Time. We will go to both city councils. Okay. And these two new IGAs will basically become uh, the starting point for conversations with our other city partners. But this is where you talked in our learning session, and I just wanted our budget committee members to make sure we understood this milestone right of having joint meetings correct okay. thank you chair next slide please another important effort within rusd has been working closely with our city partners along with other utilities such as pge and northwest natural to prepare for infrastructure improvements to support industrial red readiness as well as for residential and other types of development in 2021, as you've heard a number of times today, we completed the East Basin Master Plan for our regional sanitary system and treatment facilities. And we are currently in the midst of developing our West Basin Master Plan. These sanitary master plans are 20-year plans that will help us determine the critical strategic investments that we will need to make to meet the needs of growth within both basins. Both master plans are based upon gaining a deeper knowledge and understanding of what our respective city partners envision for their communities and how we can help them achieve their community vision. Recently, our preliminary work on the West Basin Master Plan has been critically valuable to RUSD's work to coordinate with North Plains and Hillsborough on the potential semiconductor opportunities related to the Federal CHIPS Act. As you may know, Tracy Rainey from our governmental affairs team has been down in Salem a number of times this session to testify to the Joint Committee on Semiconductors about the importance of sanitary and stormwater infrastructure to the semiconductor and advanced manufacturing sectors. Our team has developed preliminary infrastructure improvements and costs that would be needed to serve a large semiconductor facility in either North Plains or Hillsboro. We are working hard to be better prepared for these and other type of development opportunities within our service boundaries. Next slide. If I could, if I could just touch on that for a second, sure. Joe. You know, I've, I have conversations with um, the mayor, North Plains, and, and their staff about their urban ground, or urban growth boundary development, you know, their growth, residential growth, all those kinds of things. It would, it, or if we just stop there and we don't include the semiconductor activity, are they, set, I guess, as they, for future services and this future growth, or is there gonna be some enhancements on clean water services part that's gonna be necessary? They will probably need to be improvements, but that's the whole basis of the West Basin Master Plan is looking at, at least on the sanitary side, 
of our work in terms of preparing for what their growth aspirations are and what they want to do. It's just been kind of elevated with this whole semiconductor opportunity that has popped up in the last six to eight months. So. Yeah, because I, I could imagine 10 years from now, they'll be double the size they are. Correct. So, Correct. yeah, okay. Filled with no grocery store. <laughs> That's coming, hopefully. Um, <laughs> Sherwood, if they uh, follow through, if they are able to follow through on the reworking or revisioning of the area at Roy Rogers and LeBeau Road for, say, a 200-acre uh, flat industrial area, will you be needing to do some additional work there, or do you have capacity already in that area because of everything you've done? Great question. We are working with Sherwood. We need a new pump station, actually, that we are looking at a site along Roy Rogers that the city actually owns to put a new pump station uh, to serve that Sherwood West area. Uh, that's the largest improvement. It might need to be different if it's a semiconductor or advanced manufacturing type facility, but, but that's does the that largest. Does that rise to the occasion to be an item on a bullet list like no, this? No, okay. not at this point. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Last, RUSD will continue to lead efforts in the coming year to partner with our 12 cities in a variety of ways. We have increased our educational opportunities for city leaders and staff, such as CWS Essentials, that the chair mentioned earlier today, and various tours within our watershed and our facilities. Our monthly community connection newsletter goes out to elected officials within all of our cities, special districts, and metro, highlighting key projects, initiatives, and news from the district. We have an amazing group of project engineers and technical staff within our organization. You've heard that throughout today's presentation, but I'm very pleased that we added another planner uh, to our systems planning team this past year. With that additional planner, we are much better positioned to work earlier in the concept development planning phase in these expansion areas in cities such as Sherwood, King City, Tigard, and Beaverton. This earlier engagement with our cities will prove to be beneficial as we incorporate our knowledge and expertise into their early planning efforts. And as a former planner, it's nice to have more planners in our organization. So that's all except for the next slide and I'll take any questions the board may have. <clears throat> well, I'd just like to thank you for including CWAC on the Community Connections news newsletter. Always like seeing that. Great. Joe, those partnerships are great. Are there any areas of growth that CWS is concerned about that it foresees in three, five, six years that it could potentially have a challenge serving? I think the game changer, uh, thank you for that question, would be a semiconductor type facility in North Plains or Hillsboro, for example, something in the 500 plus acres. That would be a game changer in terms of figuring out how to do that and do it in a timely manner. And it, as Diane had said earlier, those, those are big dollar costs. Um, that would be the biggest challenge that I see. I think the other things we're doing, we're trying to manage that growth and work with our partners and anticipate it. And I think the, the basin planning that we are doing in sanitary is key to that. And we also do that, uh, we'll be doing that with our sub-basin planning in stormwater and, and surface water management to get around that and anticipate the growth there as well. Good to hear, thank you. Does anybody remember if there is a deadline by which companies have to apply as a three years, I commitment? I think it's either 18 months or 24. Yeah. yeah. So it's still way out there. I, I don't have a question. I just want to say, Joe, I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. And I think that in your title, the word relationship really speaks to who you are and watching the work that you've done with the cities, with con constituents, whomever. You, you, it's really nice to have you here and I really appreciate the work that you and your department are doing. It, it's, it was a great change in the organization. Thank you, I really appreciate that. There's nothing else, 
I'll leave it the best for last, right, Bob? <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Here's song, members of the committee. My name is Bob Baumgartner. I am the director for regulatory affairs. I'm here to talk to you today about our regulatory affairs budget. Uh, and with that, I want you to notice that all the slides that have people from my program, they're all working hard and smiling both. So I think that's <laughs> well, Can you remind me the name of the gal on the right hand slide because she was the presenter for regulatory affairs at, at CWS Essential, and I have to practice names. Yes. Uh, the person on the right-hand side is uh, Jamie Hughes. Uh, she does adequate work for our department. <laughs> <laughs> when did you get a sense of humor? talking in terms that I don't understand most of the words anyway, and here he ends with a sense of humor. I'll, I'll try to it's, put, it's a, put a cap on that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and if you'll turn to page 187, you can follow along, please. As you'll see, our budget, we have an increase in the personal service budget of 23%. We are adding three new people, requesting three new people for the regulatory affairs program. Uh, the 23% also envisions filling some of the positions that we have had open for a long time. A common theme that you will hear or have heard is the difficulty of filling positions of the regulatory affairs is particularly a small community in the world to pull people from. Uh, I expect we will do that, but that's part of the increase. The material and services is a 10% reduction. We've done a lot of work over the last year to really manage our budget, especially with some of our laboratory equipment, uh, looking for uh, holding some of the laboratory equipment over until we move into the new Ripple building. I will touch on that. Some of the reduction is associated with that, as well as uh, reducing some of our personal services contracts as we try to internalize as much of that work as we can with the two new or the three new FTE. Uh, so overall, it is a reduct or a 12% increase in the budget uh, and three new FTE proposed. Next slide, please. The program is really divided into three uh, subparts. The laboratory, uh, you've heard a lot about our laboratory already today. Our laboratory does an extensive amount of both monitoring and analysis to keep us in compliance. Um, several thousand uh, each year, we'll get to that at the end. Uh, but what we are seeing is a big difference in our laboratory process is instead of the focus being almost solely on routine compliance type of monitoring or routine monitoring to support operations, a lot more project monitoring to support the research that we do, uh, to both support uh, both ends of the research program, and even a lot of our operations have really focused themselves a lot more on the monitoring they do so that we know better the outcomes we are shooting for. So our laboratory is doing a lot more project management, uh, and as our world gets a little bit more difficult, we are doing a lot more method development. Logan mentioned the ammonia process that we do to make sure that we are not generating disinfection byproducts. We talked about that last year. Uh, what we were able to do at our laboratory is develop methods to measure that at much lower levels than typically can be measured. Because of that, we are able to convince DEQ that we could do that routinely. Uh, we could monitor it. Working with Logan's team, we demonstrated that uh, the process he identified would allow us to not create those, uh, and the big advantage of that is we don't have to have limits that we have to worry about, uh, but more we are not discharging a toxicant into the river. The Environmental Services Program does a lot of work to uh, regulate industrial discharges to make sure that uh, our infrastructure is not damaged. You heard Logan talking, and Diane as well, about our conveyance system, especially the pipes. 
uh, the controlling the industrial discharges is critically important to making sure we don't damage those pipes. So put them on the process of decay. Uh, we've worked with Jack and his research group to develop in-stream or in-line monitors that allow us to track down, pinpoint where some of the discharges that may be causing problems are. And I've had some noted success recently uh, tracking those down and then working with the industry to control those discharges to help us expand or continue that uh, lifespan of that infrastructure. And then the compliance services, which is largely the group that ensures we stay within compliance. Uh, more importantly, that group starts to look to the future to try to create those pathways so that we can continue to operate our system the way we think is appropriate and develop the uh, regulatory structure to get there. Uh, we do permit negotiations both for air quality, water quality, and occasionally solid waste and other regulatory programs. Uh, we do interact a lot with the uh, research programs, uh, and that just, I think, helps us explain why our visions going forward are successful. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Last year, uh, we talked a lot about the permit that we had coming up. I'll touch on that just a little bit. Um, after a rocky start with our friends at Oregon's Department of Environmental Quality, we were able to successfully negotiate a permit that got us almost everything that we asked for or wanted, which I think was a huge lift. I want to commend Jamie, who you heard about, Julia from my department, because those two were really the big lifters of that permit. But what's more important is we had hundreds of people within the district helping us and supporting us in that permit. We're a small group. We could not be successful without the good collaboration and the really the investment of all of the other teams. Uh, we really did look for how we are going to account for growth. But as we expected, there is a lot more monitoring associated with this permit. The other thing that we see is we used to typically just have to send in the results of our monitoring. DEQ is now asking us to send in all of our traceable quality assurance, quality control uh, information. Somebody mouthed, wow, yeah, that was a big one. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's huge. Uh, Julia from our department did a tremendous job of figuring out how to organize that and be able to provide it and send it in. But for every piece of data we have that we can send in as a result, there are probably a dozen pieces of data that show that we follow QA, QC. Yes, ma'am? Why did they do that? Uh, every now and then those filters come on, so. Um, yeah, yeah. Make, <laughs> make, make sure yours is there. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, I guess I, does it make more work for them too? They well, may not like know they what they got. Their data. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is it an issue of trust? Yeah. Sorry, we're discussing over here. We'll get to your answer in just a moment. <laughs> well, 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 you're both right. Um, it, in comparison of the Federal Clean Water Act and the uh, Federal Drinking Water Act, which came just after the Clean Water Act, uh, the uh, Clean Water Act requires us to have a QAQC program to be able to document the QAC program. And if DEQ ever wants to, they can come in and look at all of our QAQC data. So we, we have to maintain it in some format. Uh, the Drinking Water Act uh, requires the submittal of quality assurance, quality control information. Because of that, most drinking water facilities just contract out their sampling and analysis, makes it easier on them. We internalize that. We have a, an exceptionally good QAQC program. Uh, our data is accepted by uh, USGS, any other federal requirement, uh, but it is a lot to monitor. The DEQ wanted us to put that in a format that they could drop it into their data system so that they could provide oversight if they needed uh, and when they needed it. Does that answer your question? So we're kind of doing their work for them? By we're all part of the same team, yeah. oh, ma'am. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder, Bob. You could be a politician, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. But, so on their side, though, was their system able to consume, not 
the volume, but the vast array, or did they have to make some changes to in order to really do what they maybe didn't realize they wanted to do? We had to do a fair amount of work with them to make sure that they could accept all of our QAQC. Most municipalities have much less monitoring than we do, and it's much more straightforward. Uh, our permit is very complex. There are all kinds of if-then statements that we had to make sure we could get that to them and get that to them in a way that was useful, but uh, we were able to do that. Um, Another key aspect of our permit was to get conditions for our natural treatment system that we could operate under. So this year, we we're doing an extensive amount of uh, monitoring and operational adjustments out at our natural treatment system to make sure that we can fully operate that. A lot of the monitoring will help us understand the influence of how we operated on the effluent quality to ensure we can meet the kind of limits that we have to achieve. Chair Harrington, you mentioned the heat dome. Uh, to the extent that there's a silver lining of that heat dome, it really helped form our thinking of what we had to do and had to create for permit conditions so that we could continue to operate the natural treatment system going forward in the advent uh, or the potential for future heat domes or in general just uh, increased heating from a global climate change. You heard my good friend Logan talk about getting close at, uh, and that would have been at our derm treatment plant. The heat dome also helped us decide how we were going to manage compliance so that we could have a much better chance of ensuring that we would be in compliance at our uh, water resource recovery facilities and give us more options to do that, uh, which we were able to do. But with that said, I will note under those conditions, the discharge from Durham, although it was close to the criteria, was actually quite a bit cooler than the river was. Uh, and the work that they did will actually help cool that uh, effluent, drop that temperature down, or help us manage how much of that temperature goes out. So what I'm particularly proud of, and I'm using this just as an indication of how we work, is that not only were we able to figure out how to be in compliance, but more importantly, we did that in a way that will provide additional benefits to the river while we were doing so. Uh, or mostly that was Logan and his team doing the additional benefits. Uh, we do have quite a bit of additional reporting with the natural treatment system. Uh, in addition, uh, this year's permit focused a lot of e effort on stormwater. Uh, municipal stormwater, the DEQ has a vision of requiring retention of all stormwater from development on site, uh, which is a huge lift. We were able to work with DEQ to provide some criteria in which that would not be a practical alternative. More importantly, DEQ was able to craft language with us that basically says if we can come up with a better strategy and convince them of it, they will accept that. So the work we have been doing indicates that we can develop a strategy. We work very closely with NSCS uh, and uh, Joe's team to see if we can figure out how to make this work, but I believe we will have a strategy that actually generates better outcomes for the stream as well as for uh, the development of the development community. Uh, it remains to be seen, but I completely I believe we will be able to get there. Uh, the other significant change is the DEQ tried to respond to a debate we discussed before and discussed last year of whether stormwater has to meet water quality criteria. Uh, they elected to stay with the program that requires us to treat stormwater to the maximum extent practicable, but they really did want to have a program by which if there was a discharge from stormwater that had the potential to cause a violation of a water quality standard, that we had to have a program then to go out, figure out what that is, respond to it, come up with a plan to solve it. Uh, we have a very good program to do that, but there's a lot more bureaucracy show, associated with that now. So, we, yes, Jerry. We, could you, 
Could you just give me an example of how that would occur? Because I, when we start talking about stormwater, we we don't have a lot of control over that. So yeah, what, so what let me let me situation? give you a couple of examples. And the problem is, just like you said, it's it's difficult to control. It's difficult to understand and identify where it's coming from. One of the uh, problems that we found and have responded to was very high levels of zinc. Zinc is a heavy metal uh, and it's toxic, especially in its dissolved form. Uh, and it's very toxic to plants, uh, which is why people like to use zinc on their roof, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what we were finding in some of our monitoring was Especially early in the winter, we'd see very, very high levels of zinc in one of our stormwater runoff areas. Uh, we went and did further monitoring. We took a look at uh, what people sell for zinc throwing on roof, and it matched uh, almost exactly with what we were seeing in the stream. So we've gone out to the uh, homeowners association. We've talked to them about the zinc, how much is putting on, how much they're putting on. They're working with their uh, contractor who helps them with zinc on the roof for all of their area and seeing a reduction then in the amount of zinc that's being used. Another way that we have followed up on it is we did have a site uh, that was not well managed, had a lot of sediment turbidity coming off uh, and some metals associated with that. Uh, and we have gone out and worked with them, co actually collaborated with the city they were in to uh, have them develop a plan to implement what we call the best management practices. Those best management practices should keep that sediment on site, capture the water, and hopefully control and prevent the sources of the sediment so that it's not coming off. So it's a very much a site-specific response. Did that help? Yeah, that, the, the um, zinc thing was, um, that was an excellent idea because I, I just drove by a house the other day and the roof was all white. And it's got that powder on there and it's, it's exactly what you were just describing. So I, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to why DEQ hasn't kind of stepped up a little bit more and said, let's, let's talk about other methods than putting that stuff that then we have to deal with when the rain comes and it's in our system. The, the application of uh, pesticides, including herbicides like zinc, is actually regulated by the Department of Agriculture uh, rather than DQ. So it kind of falls between the state uh, regulatory entities, uh, and agriculture typically thinks more about uh, agriculture than they do urban roofs. They were very helpful and willing to come out and speak with the community for us, though. Yeah. So it's just it's a matter of getting to the right agencies. Thank you. You bet. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the zinc uh, will react with the soils, uh, which helps reduce the toxicity of it. It's really toxic in its dissolved form. So especially with the fine clays that we have, if it forms a bond to those clays, it's not really in the toxic form anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and then pretreatment, uh, we are doing a lot of work. We touched on it a little bit uh, with the pretreatment uh, with the pipes, our pretreatment program is picking up the response for the complaints so that if we follow them up, they will work with them. We will set up a uh, process with the city so that we can do all the bureaucratic tra tracking that we do. Uh, and to just go off, um, document a little bit, uh, Chair Harrington, you mentioned PFOS. So I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, what we are doing with the PFOS. It's a very closely uh, managed program between our regulatory affairs group, uh, pretreatment program, and the research organization. A lot of people really involved in that. Um, but the regulations at the federal level are moving with screaming speed for our type of world that we live in. EPA has proposed drinking water criteria at four nanograms per liter which would be like one drop from a dropper in about five Olympic swimming pools or something like that. It's a pretty low amount. 
Uh, however, what they are identifying as their uh, toxic threshold is 1,000 times less than that, and so their drinking water criteria says, we'll be at four, we want to go to zero. Uh, at the same time, the uh, EPA is publishing, or they have published, uh, draft water quality standards for uh, several of the perfluorinated compounds, including the PFOS and the PFOA. Uh, those should not be a really big issue for us to achieve, uh, but those standards really only address the toxicity and the way that it kills an or organism uh, you know, almost immediately. Where we expect to see a lot bigger problem uh, for compliance would be when uh, EPA publishes criteria for human health, because that's going to be based on these very, very low numbers. We don't know what that number is going to be yet, uh, but we are worried about it. Uh, those kind of issues will influence not only discharging into the river, but we also expect EPA to be working uh, to publish, or they are working to publish, limits for our biosolids. Uh, we have been doing quite a bit of monitoring uh, and evaluation and follow-up. We have had some very good success reducing some of the industrial loads coming to us, uh, which makes it easier for us to be able to expect to see what we can uh, will in the future, be able to demonstrate we have a process that does reduction. Our initial uh, monitoring of our biosolids and the soils where we are applying biosolids is largely good news for us. We are not seeing really uh, high levels of buildup. Uh, we don't have the kind of levels uh, that you hear about, especially in the East Coast or the Midwest along the Great Lakes where there are uh, producers of the PFOS. We see it coming to us from landfills, from the high-tech industry, uh, from metals finishers, and so we are getting some idea of who we have to work with to start reducing it. One of the uh, actions that we are doing, though, is we are bringing the PFOS analysis in-house, uh, simply because it is uh, very expensive to send it out. Uh, Chair Harrington, you asked how much our equipment costs. This is going to run us somewhere between two hundred fifty and five hundred fifty thousand dollars. We expect uh, we have an RFP it's out there. Than out of house. Oh yeah, uh, this, this is a, a very good investment for us. It also gives us the opportunity, should we wish, to provide support to other municipalities or other people in our program that uh, will be looking to find places that they have to measure the PFOS. Right now, there aren't too many entities that do it. So we'll bring that in-house. Uh, we estimate it may take us as long as a year to really get it up and running where it's in, in production. Two things, if I might. Yes, ma'am. which I think then linked to an article that uh, said, I don't know if it's correct or not, that the Hillsborough landfill is a source of PFAS. Don't know if it's right or not, so I should follow up and get that to somebody. Um, then the second thing I wanted to bring up is, I, this past winter it seemed like there were more local jurisdictions using that de-icing liquid on the roads. Do we need to worry about that from a stormwater standpoint? So I'll take your two questions in series, if I may. Oh, I didn't, I, uh, the first one was just a mention. You don't have to answer it, but you can always answer it, if you think there's a question in there. <laughs> so we have been monitoring the landfill. We have a very good idea of what their contribution is and what it means to us. We have also been working. Good, I with, won't worry then. Uh, I didn't say that. Uh, I'll say, call the, Clean Water Services. They know some good stuff. Call my yes. friend Bob. Call Bob. Yes, <laughs> At home. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's all right. So if, you are, if you are interested, Chair Harrington, we can certainly give you a very good understanding of what's coming from the landfill and the work we're doing with them to try to figure out what our future is with them. 
Uh, as far as the, the icing material that is being applied, that is one of our new permit requirements that we do track that. Uh, the, most of that de-icing material does have a very strong oxygen demand, so if it's running off and getting into a stream, it can cause problems with uh, dissolved oxygen. That's usually if it is misapplied or applied at much higher rates than it should, but we're trying to make sure we can track where that's going and whether that kind of condition would, would occur. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And with that, uh, the other area that we're doing a lot of work with is supporting the industrial pretreatment program to make sure that the industrial discharges do not discharge anything that may burden or impair our ability to use reuse in the future if we go uh, in that direction as we anticipate. Next slide, please. They just want to touch a little bit on some of the compliance issues you did hear about uh, problems that we have had at our plants with the uh, generators that we use. The Clean Air Act uh, has changed over time and has changed dramatically over several years. Well, we have had rather an archaic permit. Uh, the new permits being issued uh, catch up with the requirements of the Clean Water Act. But more importantly, one of the aspects of the, excuse me, that was the Clean Air Act, of the Clean Air Act is with these generators, if you're using a generator that occurred before the development of those standards, you can continue to use them as long as you operate them uh, under a certain condition, basically operate them the way they're supposed to be operated. But as soon as you have to start repairing those or upgrading them, all bets are off and you have to meet the new permit limits. Uh, and as simple as it may sound, we have just run our generators to where they need to be repaired. Once they need to be repaired, we really need to upgrade those generators. And they are so old, even if we could find parts, uh, we probably could never get them to meet the cry or limits. We'd have to purchase new generators. They're very expensive. And so that is why, uh, I don't know if that's why, but that just does tie into or help move us towards the renewable natural gas. Along with the renewable natural gas, we are monitoring for greenhouse gases so that we can track what our discharge of greenhouse gas is. Our regulatory requirements are fairly simple for that. A lot of the calculation for greenhouse gas is based on estimates, algebra, uh, we have purchased some equipment and we'll be looking to actually get some better measurements so that we can do a better job of understanding what our trends are. Um, and so at the moment right now, between now and when we get the re uh, renewable natural gas, we are just flaring a lot more gas than we used to out of our pipes. And I don't think anybody thinks that's a good solution or a good long-term solution, but it is what we're doing in the immediate future. Uh, Logan mentioned the number of pump stations we have. Uh, pump stations are an example of the aging infrastructure that we do have, and we have had some compliance issues associated with our pump stations. Those compliance issues are associated, one, with where a coupling broke off uh, when we were trying to do what in effect was a bypass. Uh, we didn't have that monitored, and we had some uh, liquid being discharged for several hours. Uh, we were able to track that down. We did a very good job of fixing it and responding to it. Uh, we've had a similar one. DEQ did take enforcement action on the pump station overflow that we did have. Uh, ended up with uh, a $10,000 fine, which sounds to me like a whole lot, but it was as small as DEQ could make the fine, mostly because of the near Herculean efforts we did to uh, repair and mitigate as a result and respond. Instead of paying a fine, we worked with DEQ to do what they call a supplemental environmental project. Uh, and we worked with uh, environmental group that worked with uh, school uh, with disadvantaged children so that we could do some environmental education and restoration and get a broader group of people understanding why we do the environmental work we do. Uh, but the gist of that all is we need to do some work with our pump stations to make sure 
uh, they're brought up to the modern age of expectations for environmental management that they communicate to us. We can watch them remotely so that we can respond in a more effective and efficient manner. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to touch on is the uh, laboratory that we're moving to the uh, Ripple building. We're excited about that move. Uh, Chair Harrington, again, you mentioned the HVAC systems, and people are going to think I just put you here so I had something to react to, but. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. No. Washington County, $48 million of problems. We'll do something to a girl. Well, that's, that's beyond my, my knowledge, so I won't go there. But our HVAC system at our current uh, laboratory is in a tough state of disrepair. We use what we call fume hoods so that uh, air can be pulled up. We can have a slash that comes down so that people can work with dangerous chemicals and not be exposed to them. Nonetheless, there's all kinds of acids and bases, which should never mix, being pulled up into uh, these fumes, which is, or into these hoods, which is hard then on the HVAC system, starts to get holes in it, uh, and then they don't work as well. So several of our hoods are no longer fully operational. If they are not fully operational, we can't guarantee they're fully operational, then we don't use them for dangerous chemicals because we don't want to put our staff at risk. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of moving around of our equipment and our analyses so that we can keep people safe, but they are starting to decay and fall apart. Uh, the other thing we need to do is make sure that we keep positive air pressure in our laboratory systems. We are trying to measure things at such low levels that we now have to make sure we understand when our uh, crews are going to provide um, or put, uh, take care of our grass and add fertilizer because the fertilizer has ammonia in it and that ammonia, some of it will volatilize, and then we can pick that up in our lab. Since we hold our QA, QC so, so tight, as I talked about before, we've got to make sure that we are scheduling our monitoring to not coincide when, when we may get some of that. It's just an additional hurdle to try to take care of. <laughs> Similarly, uh, over time, the equipment we purchase gets much more sensitive. And some of our lab equipment uh, really is sensitive to the flow of electricity that goes through it. So if we change that flow of electricity, it can change our results. We usually depend on a building-wide controller to help us with that. Uh, ours isn't working so well now, so we have individual ones at our um, sensitive equipment. But all that's an indication that we, if we want to continue to provide the level of analysis we do in service, we would be having to upgrade the laboratory in any event. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to start fresh. Uh, and that's going to help us uh, as we really start to look to emerging pollutants uh, beyond the PFAS equipment that we have talked about. Uh, that's going to, or that suite of equipment will help us really get into the uh, trace organics, really be a trace organic lab. Uh, so as pollutants emerge, we need to know what to do with them. We will be able to do uh, the monitoring to help us understand and analysis to help us understand where it's coming from, what its fate is, uh, and at what levels we are working and looking into the future. So with that, uh, we are preparing the move. There is a lot of design work to do. I'm excited about the design. Uh, as I said before, we work very closely with the research team who also has some laboratory work, but this will allow us to all be in one place and working as one team, which I think I'm actually very excited about uh, and I think will be really good. And with that, the next slide, please. Checking my time, got three minutes. Um, we're really looking for the next permit already. Uh, we said our permits come in five years. Uh, we don't have the luxury of waiting a few years to start preparing for our next permit. 
In fact, we're starting to look much longer than that. We're starting to look 20, 30 years out. And the rubric for that is we need to understand what we think that regulatory condition is going to be several years out from now, the lifespan of a wastewater or a water resource recovery facility, so that we know if we're building things now, it's going to be consistent with what we want long term so we don't strand equipment. So if we have to do something very quickly, like respond to a uh, new development coming in or a new industry coming in, that we're doing it in a way that's consistent with a long-term view uh, and can maintain and not strand equipment. The other thing we were working on, and last year, we, or two years ago, we talked about our lab developing a method to measure aluminum and a measure of the biologically available aluminum. Last year, we talked about how we worked with Oregon's DEQ so that they could understand how we measured the biologically available aluminum. The advantage to that is both EPA, when they developed the criteria, and DEQ, as they are developing the implementation criteria, have cited the use of that methodology to uh, apply the biological aluminum. The reason that's so important is Logan mentioned chemical costs and the amount of alum, which is an aluminum product, that we use to help remove phosphorus. And Logan also mentioned the efforts that they have done to improve the biological process for removing phosphorus, which, if we can make that work, will allow us to uh, not only get rid of another toxic in, into the river, uh, save us lots of money, $600,000 a year or so, if I understand, uh, in chemical, chemical costs. So over the next two years, we have uh, an agreement with DEQ to be able to conduct the studies that allow us to optimize uh, this effort. Uh, and we have initiated discussions with DEQ to see if we can change the regulatory structure that drives the requirements for the phosphorus limits. And hopefully we will be able to be successful one way or another. I know we will be successful, but hopefully we can move that to a much stronger reliance on the biological uh, process. The reason I mention that is uh, really looking out several years in advance is what's needed for us to be able to continue to control our fate. As somebody said, we're a uh, big discharge into a pretty small river and any of these environmental or regulatory issues will come our way sooner rather than later. And with that, next slide please. That's it, uh, and that just summarizes our team. Oops, one thing I forgot to mention is Chair Harrington, you also mentioned mercury. Uh, we have completed all the mercury work with the dentists. They are in 100% compliance, a major source of the mercury. We have uh, mercury minimization plans that we are working with now with other laboratories. So we actually had to get our mercury out of the lab first. Uh, and. <laughs> and uh, with uh, hospitals and others to remove mercury. That's uh, now we've gotten rid of uh, most of the major sources of mercury uh, coming into our plants. Uh, further treatment uh, such as membranes will probably be the next step to reduce our contributions of mercury. I might just be remembering something very wrong. Okay, high potential of that uh, in this case. I seem to recall a conversation years ago we might have had uh, about mercury falling through rainfall due to coal plant emissions over in China and that the EPA with our stormwater permit may be holding in the future hold us accountable to the mercury levels even though that water never touched our plants. Um. No, your, your memory is spot on, Chair Harrington. The predominant source of mercury is due to runoff. And the predominant source of mercury in that runoff is uh, from air deposition from uh, coal-fired plants overseas, coming all the way over the Pacific and then dropping down at rainfall onto us. Uh, it does drop down, come off in the um, stormwater as well. DEQ did develop what they call the uh, mercury TMDL, and that mercury TMDL did identify uh, their relative estimate of contribution, which is 
spot on, really, with ours. I don't think that's the debate. Uh, but what they asked for is for us to make sure that the best management practices we are doing in the stormwater air okay. arena uh, capture uh, mercury as well as other pollutants. And so the monitoring we are doing to make sure that we feel what we are implementing uh, we'll be monitoring for mercury, we'll be monitoring for suspended solids so that we can see how that mercury is traveling with suspended solids. And if we find somewhere where we need to focus attention, we will, but we expect most of our best management practices that control the solids will control the movement of mercury. So, so we're not being held accountable for removing other people's, sources of other people's mercury is what I got out of all that. Yes, ma'am. You're more eloquent than I am. I like to beat around the bush, I guess. But no, we are not being held responsible for what's coming to China. No, we are being held worrying. responsible for implementing reasonable best management. You know, once I it don't gets like here, we're responsible for it. But no, no, no. Once it enters our treatment systems, we're responsible for it. But the nature of mercury falling from rainfall into our stormwater, we're not responsible for that because we're not introducing it. What we are responsible for is implementing reasonable best management practices to control and keep the sediment on the ground that this mercury moves with. We're not being asked to do something about China. Yeah, yeah. but that's my, I yeah. think that's my point. When, when it gets here and it gets into our system, we are responsible for best practices. Yeah. Okay. But in our, yeah, just in wait. our treatment <laughs> system, right? Lasts. But not in our stormwater permit. In stormwater too, in so. Stormwater. Mm -hmm. so That's but is that where we deal with it with membranes in our stormwater management? No. That's no. on the wastewater side. That's what I thought. Best management stormwater is best management practices. Okay, got it. So it's all interconnected because the mercury that's in the river and the water quality standards that are set can drive TMDLs which then puts waste load allocations on the wastewater plants. It's also then, we've been trying to avoid it on the stormwater side to have a water quality standard on yes. each outfall. Yes. yes. So we've been doing the best management practices. But there's a trajectory that Bob and I watch in the next 10 to 20 years yeah. of water quality. Uh, Stormwater is not going to get any easier. Yeah. No. EPA identifies the only sector where pollution is increasing in the United States is stormwater, so I expect they'll continue to think of ways to encourage us to do a better job. Uh, is there a political risk given that, so let me start over. Uh, during, so I was a Metro counselor for 12 years now county chair on my fifth year and during the course of that time there was some concern at the political level that may have gone at the administrative level around DEQ the nature of DEQ's work in both regulatory regulating and compliance uh, and I understood all of that but what I'm wondering about is, just as we've seen the swings of different, um, like EPA and others from one administration to another, might a potential future be that swing at the state level, yet since the permit is held by EPA, and administered through DEQ that at the state level it might swing one way, yet EPA still be in the other way and things will get weird. Well, just to try to answer that, um, the relationship between DQ and EPA has always been a bit of a struggle and I think that's true of all states as states try to implement what they think is the uh, 
best thing for the state and EPA tries to wrestle with things on a more national level. Yeah. Chair Harrington, I'm sure you've heard the rubric that all, all politics is local. The closer you get to the local, the different perspectives come up and I think that is part of what influences DEQ. Over the last years, DEQ has really struggled in their relationship with EPA and others because of the backlog of their NPDES permits. Oh. And they have worked very hard on trying to reduce that backlog. One of the things I think we need to recognize is that uh, the stronger our DEQ is, the more self-confidence they have as an entity, the more they are able to work with groups like us who are trying to be innovative. I know in their comments to us, at uh, times they tell us they'd like to help us out more, but we're way ahead of everybody else. They like where we're going, but it's just difficult for them. Uh, and we, when I talked about our uh, permit, I noted the initial rocky start, and the rocky start was just the flavor of where DEQ and EPA were initially being pushed, or EPA was initially pushing DEQ, was to just get the permit out. It's been called you get the permit you deserve, not the one you want. Uh, and it took us a while to get past that and convince and work with DEQ to get a better outcome from that. Uh, so I do think there is some risk of that, but I, uh, as frustrated as we may occasionally get with our friends at DEQ, they've done a good job trying to balance what they need to do, protect the environment, and allow groups like us to be uh, innovative. And Diane, that was probably an answer you should have given rather than me. No, but it, it's really important not to us to support a strong DEQ. It, it's critical to our success. Um, EPA's um, headquarters um, works real closely with our, with our work with the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. In fact, Andrew Sawyer, who's the water program manager, is going to be coming out, I believe, to the Oregon Association of Clean Water Agencies. So Clean Water Services works on statewide policy through Oregon Aqua. So we're really trying to articulate from national to um, state and then with our work with um, DEQ, but it, it's it's a it, it's managing relationships. It really is. The, everyone has a role in this, and we try to provide the best science. And I think that's been our winning strategy, right? So, from a regular uh, from a government relations standpoint, politically, are we doing enough as a board and as staff to make sure that? those who control the purse strings and the appointments of a DEQ administrator know that we really appreciate a positive and innovative supporting DEQ? Uh, um, that's a good question, and it is directly associated with the uh, state agenda that your board adopted, okay. and we testified just recently in support of DEQ's budget specifically to support this work. A healthy DEQ is very important to us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Chair, Chair Song, we have a, Director Rogers has a question from online. Thank you, I was uh, patiently waiting because I always like to hear Bob speak. Uh, I've had the pleasure, it's more of a comment than a, than a question. That, Heard Bob and had the privilege of uh, being at, uh, at conferences where I had the good fortune of speaking as well, but not on his technical issue. Bob's going to be a huge loss to this particular organization. There's just not that many people, I can tell you, in the United States who have this sort of, uh, of complex set of skills. And so I uh, had a chance to talk to you for a moment before I had to leave Bob, but I I, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that uh, we can bend your arm a bit and to get some of that uh, expertise because as you said, you, you hope that you could get uh, it restaffed up uh, when you leave. And as I told you, I have no faith at all that uh, things are going to calm down with any certainty as you just were discussing regarding, you know, Clean Water Act changes or interpretations. And I, I agree with the DEQ that provision we've always said the DEQ needs to be strong because it's homegrown. They understand and they have uh, some understanding of what we're trying to do. But Bob, I uh, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for hopefully what you're going to do. And thank you for being a national treasure. And I say that with no small uh, amount of 
of, of grandeur. I, I, it's absolutely true. I, I've seen you speak. I know that people are around the country are dependent upon what you have in that uh, brain. And you, you tell your wife that you're not quite old enough to retire. You need to uh, stick around a bit and, 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 and uh, give Is us some Is this gonna work. be your last budget with us, Bob? I see Joe Bell oh, yeah, saying I don't know. no. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Okay. No, I was so afraid. You're the, you're the third one to ask me, so I'm starting to get worried. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, I'm, no, it's more from a risk standpoint. I'm like, oh, I, it's hard to imagine a future. But at the same time, uh, I have had the pleasure of hearing presentations by Jamie. It's Jamie, right? Jamie yes. Hughes. Uh, and possibly others on your team, and you've talked about how you've built up your team. You've said team, 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 team. So I know you've done a great job, not only for the present, but into the future decades. So. Thank you. I think very highly of, of my team. I'm very fortunate to work in an environment where my staff knows more and is better than I am. Bob and I talk about we're raising the pirate flag, aren't we? <laughs> so we have some pirating that we're doing. But, Commissioner um, Rogers, did you have, or Director Roberts, Rogers? <laughs> Roy. Do you have anything no. more, sir? Catherine, no, this is Roy. No, not at all. I just wanted to <laughs> say the accolades, no matter, I, I disagree with Bob in one material thing. He, he has indeed taught his staff well but you don't replace that sort of experience and knowledge. So Bob, don't underestimate who you are. You're very special in a very technical world. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I realize we have at least one member of the budget committee that has to leave now. Uh, are we, we have the budget, public comment period, the financial summary, and then the motion to approve. And I have an item to raise uh, before we move to public comment. Uh, and that is, uh, I foresee based, well, I, I mentioned it a little bit, but I only touched on it. Uh, based upon where the achievement that our CEO has, um, has achieved with where we at are at organizationally, but also what needs to happen towards the program management of all of these roadmaps and projects, uh, and that we're a little under capacity in that uh, aspect out of her office. Uh, and also, uh, I meet with Diane and Mark at least monthly, and I am known for asking probing questions, and I can see the uh, level of additional time that our CEO puts in week after week after week of 52 weeks a year. There is some additional strategic thinking capacity that is needed, uh, so I see a need to bring in two additional members to your team in order to reduce that workload that you have been absorbing all four plus years that I've been on this board. They're telling my secrets. They get emails at 3 a.m. <laughs> That's sort of the, uh, but I, I appreciate that, Chair. I don't mean to bring levity to it. And the executive team, we will talk about what we need um, moving forward to really keep this high um, execution and they remind me not to send them email. I don't expect them to answer my 3 a.m. email or my 11 o'clock email. So, but it is, we, to work at this level, the pace is huge. So, but I thank you for that acknowledgement. Appreciate it. It may be that uh, we have to address it through headcount uh, in, in a supplemental budget or something. So I'm just being transparent. I appreciate that. Okay, do we have any public comments online? Would any member viewing this meeting online via Zoom would like to provide public 
comment on anything else that you've heard for the buzzed presentations, give you just a moment to utilize the raise hand function. Not seeing any hands, Chair Song. Thank you. Okay, Kathy, summarize our day here. So you have in front of you there the summary of our um, resources and uses um, for the budget before you. Um, it's your time to deliberate now. Um, I do have a motion uh, example ahead, but if is there any discussion on the resources and uses? We always like it when one of our layperson members of the budget committee makes the motion. We have a second. Second. <clears throat> thank you, Matt. Any discussion Session. or questions? I just want to say thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I know that there are many people that I should be thanking, and I just want to make sure that you all know you did a great job. And I'm a yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Passes, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yay. Thank you, and we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Yep. And, and beyond. <laughs> about that. All right. Nice. Uh, I hope. Uh, that was like For the team. Uh, uh, did you want to call them up? What? No. Are you going to do it like that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, I think that's on my. That's on my that was a smooth, that was a good move. Yeah. Like we can. Okay, hey, thank you. I like it. So, Matt, how did you look at the hand that flashed you? No, thank you. Oh, this one? Way more than you said. No, no, no. It was good. I thought you used to do that. I always do a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and there's just so much going on. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice to have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Nice Thank to you. Have